The following program does not have a normal intro because I was really too busy smoothing other things over to get it done. So, Corey? Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the following program. I'm your host, Joe Nearman, a.k.a. Goatee Logic. That's right. This week, as it grows back in, mistakes of costume... These, this is the price I pay. <laughs> I used to have a goatee. I used to, I used to keep it like this until I grew in the beard. I like the beard better. I definitely like the beard better. We're going, we're, I'm going back to the beard. It'll take a week. So yeah, by next week I should be good. But um, yeah, so here you go. You're gonna, you're gonna get Scruffy Joe this week, and then next week back to my regular good logic look. Anyhow. Those of you who are curious, just a brief overview of my weekend. I apologize that I, I, I was hoping I might get to stream last night. I knew I might not, so that's why I sort of left it. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, family went as um, monkeys who jumped on a bed. Those of you familiar with the nursery rhyme. So we were all dressed up with, like, you know, as basically monkeys who had, like, head, head injuries. And, yeah, so... That was that was the costume theme, and went out to my brother's house. Not my sister lives next door. My brother who lives an hour away, uh, and had, had the whole family out there for that. So that was we had a great time. I got pretty plastered, sang a song or two, and yeah, had a great time. And I knew this would happen. The reason I was like so skeptical about street is I was like. If I get really drunk and then I spend an hour in a car, I'm not going to be up for streaming. It's just not going to happen. Because it's just the, the car ride home just knocks you out. It just knocks you out. So it's how I, I pulled in here. I know I, I know I drunk tech, I know I drunk posted last night on locals. I definitely drunk posted at some point last night on locals. And I was sharing perspectives <coughs> about a thematic nightmare I've had throughout my life where i'm basically in my nightmare i'm like driving and the car I, there's like a lack of control over the car maybe this comes from leading lady logic drive around all the time i don't know but it's either that like you know the brakes are out or like i'm drunk and and whatever so when we got in the car so i was i was teasing lady logic about driving when i was drunk out of my mind at this point so i was teasing her about driving so I figured I'd share that that perspective with you all. I don't know if my post made much sense, but I just figured it is what it is. So that's my weekend. That's my weekend. But a lot of stuff went down over the weekend and today. A lot of news went down over the weekend today. And I want to get to all with you now here, right now. Let's get in on it. I'm going to start off by talking with you about Trump. There are really three developments with Trump over the weekend. I'm going to go through all three of them really quickly. Number one, we'll start with the worst of the news from the Trump perspective. His criminal case in New York, brought by New York Attorney General Alvin Bragg, sorry, not District Attorney Alvin Bragg, based on, which is really a bookkeeping crime, and was supposed to start today. A couple of weeks back, you may recall that we covered here on the show that the that Alvin Bragg turned over to the defense roughly like 70,000 documents and then had another tranche, tranche of documents. Tranche is a word I don't use enough. Had another tranche of thousands of documents that he was supposed to be dropping. And Trump's like, look, we need an extra three months to go through this. I got to push this back. We got to push this trial back 90 days. Alvin Bragg said, Alvin Bragg said, yeah, they really just need 30 days. A lot of these documents are repetitive and it's kind of their fault, but you should just give them only 30 days. So what do you think the judge did? You think he listened to Trump or did he listen to Alvin Bragg? No, no, he did. He did neither. He said, Alvin, you're way too generous with the defense. Why would you give a full 30 days? We'll push it back three weeks, 21 days, plenty of time to go through 100,000 pages and documents. Of course it is. This does not bode well. I'm just telling you now, this does not bode well. This does not bode well 
if you're forgetting about the lack of time, forgetting about the lack of time, when the, the, the district attorney who's so crazed that he's trying to go after you for a case that the Southern District of New York said, there's no case here. There's no case here. Meaning the predicate crime. If we break down what this, this criminal action is about, there's a predicate crime, which means the main crime, and then there's this, and then there's the part that comes afterwards in the purported cover-up of the main crime. You know how we talk about like obstruction being like sort of like obstruction of what, like obstruction to be caught for what crime. So this is like the the New York statute he's being charged with is that he's trying to cover up his main crime. What's his main crime? His main crime purportedly, allegedly, relates to um, election law. It's federal statute. So Alvin Bragg said, we're going to use this New York state statute because I don't, I can't, pre- I can't charge him the federal statute. I'm going to say that he had this wrongful bookkeeping in furtherance of his federal law breaking. Well, who's charging with the federal law breaking? You would think Southern District of New York, right? DOJ come in there, charge him in Southern District of New York for the federal crime he broke. They looked at this case, they examined it, they scrutinized it, and they said, "There's no, there's no crime here." There's no crime here. Alvin Bragg said, I don't care what they say, that there's no crime. I say there is a crime. And then when he put down on his books, when he put down his records on his books and didn't properly reflect this, this payments to Stormy Daniels as a contribution to his election, that and even though he's not sharing that with anyone, just what the books he retained for himself, that is the crime astonishing astonishing he's trying to hide his crime that the doj doesn't think is a crime but i'm saying it is a crime and that this was a step he was trying to hide it and that's why i'm trying to get him on this state statute in in um in new york history no district attorney has ever tried prosecuting this crime this state law based on the predicate a violation of a, pro, a predicate violation of a federal statute no one's even tried it like like it's it's questionable whether it would e- whether it even makes any sense cuz the whole point is to strengthen your state laws anyhow so there you go there you go there you go so that which you would think now alvin bragg so this looney tune guy Right, you know him, the one who looks like the hamburglar, right? If you put him in a black and white stripe thing, he would definitely be the hamburglar. So he's the one who's so out of his mind, crazed with derangement for Donald Trump that he said, "I'm going to bring these charges in New York against him, and be the first one to bring criminal charges." Because this was the first one out of the gate. You might not recall because there's been four, four. There's been there were three other charges that came up. One in, in federal court in Washington, one in Florida, and then obviously Fannie Willis. So this was the first one out of the box. Even most people on the left who hate Trump were like, this is pretty weak claim. These are pretty, this is pretty stupid. This is pretty stupid. In order to try and bolster it, mainstream media has referred to this as the hush money trial because the underlying payment they're talking about is monies that he paid to Stormy Daniels for to keep her silent. Probably even though there's been denials back and forth, people speculate to keep her silent about various um, sexual contact between he and Stormy, Stormy Daniels. If he, that is what it's about, or if it's about anything else, paying her for that, as long as it's not for criminal activity, is not a crime. There's no crime in hush money. Every day... People get compensated for agreeing to be silent. People sign non-disclosure agreements literally every day, often in court. There's no crime in that. That's completely legal. But the mainstream media wants to call it the hush money trial, as if we're going to do this whole investigation to see whether or not he gave her money. And it's like, this is not a hush money trial. It's a bookkeeping trial. 
but it makes him sound so nefarious if you call it a hush money trial. And that's purposeful. I'm positive that's purposeful. They're trying to make it sound as if, oh, oh, we're going to see if we can catch them for making these illegal hush money payments when they're not illegal. Nothing about it is illegal. The only thing that's allegedly illegal is how he, he kept records of it. So, anyhow, as I was saying, so now there's all these different documents that they got from the DOJ that Alvin Bragg got from the DOJ, because it's a different agency than his, and never turned over to, in Tommy fashion. He said, you only need 30 days to go through it. Judge Merchant comes along and says, you know, no, I'm not even giving you the 30 days that Alvin Bragg wants to give you. I'll give you 21 days. This is This is unheard of. This is crazy. I had one circumstance like this as a practicing attorney. Only once in my life did I have a judge do something like this. And that was a judge who was out to punish me and make an example out of me. I'll tell you the story. It's a quick war story. It's not that long. 23 years ago. I was working for this small firm and there was a guy who was hit by a postal truck, car accident, hit by a postal truck. Well, when someone gets into a car accident, has the misfortune of getting hit by a postal truck, you have to go to federal court and sue the United States in the course of their business and you sue the United States. And there's federal tort law, which is what you have to use rather than your standard New York law. So this is why I ended up in federal court for this particular case. We filed the case, and there's specific time deadlines as to when you must file. So we filed these deadlines, and, and to, we filed in order to meet these deadlines. And when we came for discovery, so I met with the attorney for the United States, and I said, look, our, ba- our office is a little backlogged. The court gave us recommended dates for discovery. And they said, you know, make your discovery demands within two weeks and these other responses within three weeks after that, interrogatories. And they gave out this whole schedule of dates they wanted us to follow. So I said to my adversary, I said, look, we're a little swamped. Do you mind if we adjust these dates back by like two weeks apiece? And he's like, sure, I don't care. That's fine. So we did that. Okay. So there was one order, which is the recommended dates by the court, and then there was our order, which we had mutually agreed to. This happens. Attorneys agree and consent to this all the time. Few attorneys are going to be a jerk about that kind of thing because, you know, you've been there yourself sometimes, right? So it's like there's no reason to be unnecessarily hostile. It's not the end of the world, whether it's you, you end up getting documents or kicking them out a week or two later. No one cares. No one cares. Well... It's got to be approved by the court. The judge who's looking at this thing, it comes up to him. And when you're sitting there in federal court, the judge is sitting very far recessed from you. In state court, you're much closer. You're a good, let's say, if you, if you, picked, up, if you picked up a football, it's a light toss to the judge in state court. In federal court, it's marble. Everything's marble, and he's sitting way back up on. It's like they're trying to make it feel as if you came, you come before the pearly gates, and there's, you know, and you're basic. They may try to portray him like he's God. He's sitting like seventy five feet away from you, and so they call our case, and we sit in there. The judge looks at the, he looks at the his order, and he looks at the proposed chain modifications that we put up there, and he says. I'm looking here at a schedule and I'm seeing what the court recommended for discovery. And then I'm seeing what purports to be modifications that I I guess were consented by all parties here. And when I'm looking through these modified dates, I notice they all seem to be a little bit later than the dates that were recommended by the court. Now, I'm not sure why the parties here think that they are at liberty. Just pick whenever they're going to do their discovery. So I'm going to put this aside for a second. Let's just put this up on a breather. And he turns to me, he, say, he says, Counselor, is there some reason that all these dates are later when they were the dates that the court recommended to you? So I said, well, Your Honor, you know, we had this, um, we have a little bit of backlog right now. We wanted to take care of this 
uh, and my adversary was amenable towards changing the dates, and we were hoping that would be in accordance with the court. And this judge decided to undress me. And he goes to me, oh, I see. So when your client retained you, did you tell your client that your firm is incapable of handling his case in a timely manner? Now, I wisely identified this as a rhetorical question. <laughs> and I just sat mute. So then he took his earlier dates and he goes, okay, so I see the first return date here is that you're supposed to kick out discovery demands by November 1st. But that feels like it's really far away. I'm thinking we should be able to push that up to um, October 15th. Is that okay with you, Mr. Nerman? He took his earlier dates and made them earlier. What am I supposed to say to that? What do you say to that? I said, that seems eminently fair, Your Honor. He said, and the responses to that also, I see that those are supposed to come in November 30th. But if you're getting the demands out earlier, you should get those in two weeks earlier as well. Is, is, that, is that satisfactory with you, Mr. Nierman? I said that, of course, Your Honor. And then he and then he saw that like I was like I was capitulating. He's like, all right, the rest of my order here looks okay. We'll leave the rest of those dates and just the two modifications I just made. And that was his way of trying to spank me because sometimes some judges in federal court are kind of douchebags. <laughs> not all of them, not all of them. That's a rare, but the point that I, the reason I share this story with you is to tell you that when a judge takes dates that are already set up. And pushes them earlier. That's their way of saying, I don't like you. And I'm going to make you bend the knee to me. That's what a judge is doing. So when Judge Merchant has a motion here for the change of the date and to push everything back, and there's a request for one, one request for 90 days and consent by the district attorney's office for 30 days, and the judge says, oh, you don't need 30 days. 21 days is enough. To me, I don't know. Call me crazy. I call this as a reflection that Judge Merchant here is not a big fan of Donald Trump. That, to me, is more disconcerting than the fact that he didn't get the 90 days or the 30 days. It's a reflection of the mindset of the court that I just wanted to share with you based on my personal experiences as to the only time I've ever seen a judge do that. Now, it is possible. It is possible. Not to get overreactive, give the other side of the coin. If I was a lefty sitting here saying that might not be the situation, you don't know what his schedule looks like, and perhaps he's really busy. He's got some big trial that's coming up in in uh, in May, and he wants to make sure that this trial is done before that. That's definitely possible. That's definitely possible. So we don't know. We don't know because you have to. A judge has to has to assign a block of time. And they can be very busy calendars, and they have to sign a block of time. So if you want to look at it, the glass as not being, you know, half empty, if you want to look at it as half full or be hopeful, you can say maybe he just has a busy May that's already set up, and that's why, and he wasn't willing to push all the way out into June. That's possible. And he was expecting to do this trial on March 25th, and he's already ticked off that it's being pushed back a couple of weeks. These are all possible. These are all possible. I just wanted you to appreciate that mm, maybe, or maybe he just really doesn't like Trump. <laughs> it really, those are the two most likely possibilities here. Either he really doesn't like Trump, which we've seen some judges who don't, or, or he's a really busy schedule in May. They're both possible. Those are both reasonable explanations. But I wanted to give you my perspective based on my... I feel, I feel like this is giving you like some, some insight as to how judges, I, how I've seen judges in New York operate with respect to their scheduling. So when, we, so when we hear this information, it gives you what to ponder about in, in context as to how judges normally operate and what their motivating factors are. Those are the two motivating factors. Either they don't like someone and they're, and they're out to punish them, or their calendar really is just jammed up. And that happens a lot. The, the calendar thing, by the way, that would not be uncommon. It's not uncommon at all. The judges are like, look, I know I'm supposed to handle this other big trial. It's maybe not as big as, as Donald Trump, but, you know, it's relatively 
going to take two and a half weeks for me to cover this. And that's slated to end. I have all these different witnesses who are supposed to be coming in here starting on May 2nd. I need to make sure that this, this trial is done is not going to be going into that time. And that would be a reasonable perspective. I don't know what his schedule is. I wasn't in court. Today. I don't know. Anyhow, so I wanted to share, I wanted to share that with you. That was the worst news that came out for Trump today, but he got some relatively good news, relatively good news. And that relatively good news is with respect to the civil judgment where he owes, according to the state of New York and the judge from the state of New York, he owes $454 million. Now, they were supposed to begin executing on that case, have a right to execute unless he posted an undertaking, meaning a bond in the amount of $454 million by today. And he sought relief from the appellate courts. And he's like, look, this is crazy. I can't even get someone. There's no company that can afford, that can offer up a bond like that. This is no, there's no company that can do that. What am I supposed to do? Now, as I expressed on playback and also on spaces today, there's no real fear that they would be able to take his buildings out from under him tomorrow, the next week, next month, or, or any time, probably before the election. It takes a long time going to court, even once you identify a building to sort through in the court there has to be a special application to have a receiver appointed which means that other people who have interest in the building rights in the buildings loans mortgages against the building other corporations which are part owners and have an interest in the building to just you can't the, no court can say oh there's a creditor here who wants to you know collect from a debtor and the debtor has a, an interest in this building so i'm going to just ignore all these other rights of the other building owners or the other people who have a claim against this creditor or have put a lien on this property that they have to get compensated first in new york it's a race notice jurisdiction you get your notice in there first you're first in line doesn't matter if the state comes along afterwards you're in front of them so a bank that loaned money on this uh, anyone who had a judgment that precedes this would be first in line before them. So it's not like this is like something that the judge can be like, oh, he owes $450 million. Let's take Trump Towers and rename it Tish Towers. That's not how this works. Let's take 40 Wall Street and, you know, just put a big picture of Letitia across the front of it because it's hers now. That's not how any of this works. Because other people have rights and they've they've bargained for those rights and they've, you know, if they've invested in, in good faith, bona fide as bona fide investors or loaners to the pe other people who have an interest in this building. So he, you can't just ignore their rights, which is why it takes months, if not years, to sort this out. And the two ways that they could approach it is either to have a receiver appointed, and the receiver basically becomes a building manager and says, okay, this building to operate it, take care of the rents and the and 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 the electricity and the water bill and and the state tax bill and all these other bills that come through here they have to get paid and then we get our profits from the building and we get our we collect our rents and the receiver would act as a building manager overseeing all of this and then taking the profits and giving that to the judgment creditor which in this case is the state of new york now that is a relief a remedy that the state could be looking for here but before you could appoint this receiver they have to know who you know how this whole who this was paid first what, and the right to appoint the receiver is a big deal. So that's what I'm saying is it's not something that would happen this spring or even this summer. It takes a long time for courts to sort through all this. So he's not in jeopardy of lose, losing Trump Tower anytime between now and the election, in my personal estimation, or 40 Wall Street or any of these other buildings in New York. He just It's not going to happen. There's just too many, too many people who have an interest in these properties for a sort to court to sort through it quickly enough. They did have an ability to harass him because there are other remedies available to Letitia James. So they can call him, they can demand it and compel him to come in for depositions and answer interrogatories and fill out pers very personal financial records. That does, th these are powers that the judgment gives to, to the attorney general, which if he posts at the a proper undertaking, they are no longer allowed to do. Because that undertaking is basically sitting there and saying, okay, if Trump wins on appeal, he gets this money back. If Trump loses on the appeal, this is a big fat pile of money that can will go to, 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 towards satisfaction of the debt. 
So you're you, the judgment creditor here, whether it's a state of New York or a private person, are not in, in any jeopardy by a lot by being forestalled, being a stop, being prevented from harassing the bejesus out of Donald Trump, because either he's going to win and you're not going to have this judgment or he'll lose and the judgment will stay in effect. And there'll be a big fat pile of cash waiting for you by the time this appeal is over. So that's that's why the undertaking under the CPLR is supposed to be the full amount of the judgment. It's not always like that, though, especially when you're talking about oversized behemoth type judgments like this one. It's not always like that. And the appellate court gave Trump a real bit of a break. And that break which they gave him was that they slashed and they said, you don't have to pony up four hundred and fifty four million dollars. But you do need to pony up 175 million. Now, to you and me, the difference between 454 and 175 might not seem that great because they both sound like a gajillion dollars, right? And these are just big fancy names for a gajillion dollars and more money than you or I likely anticipate we're going to see, you know, in the next six months or so, if our lifetimes ever accumulated in total. So, yeah, that it sounds like just a gajillion dollars. But to someone like Donald Trump, Someone like Donald Trump, it's it. There's a significant difference, so significant that he actually said he expects to cover the 175 million in cash within 10 days. We're gonna take a quick look over here at the order that was signed by the judge. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's a pretty short order. It's only two pages. And they say, appeals having been taken to this court from an order of the Supreme Court in New York entered on February 16, 2024, from a judgment of the same court entered on about February 23rd, 2024, and defendants appellants having moved pursuant to CPLR 5519C to stay enforcement of the aforesaid order and suing judgment pending hearing and termination of appeals taken therefrom. Now, upon reading the file of the papers... It is ordered. See, this is just one page. It is ordered that the motion is granted to the extent of stay enforcement of those portions of the judgment. One, ordering disgorgement to the Attorney General of $464 million, conditioned on defendant's appellant's posting within 10 days of the day of this order and undertaking in the amount of one hundred and seventy-five. million million dollars so you post this if you post 175 million dollars this they can't come after you Letitia james can go fly a kite she can't come after you two what else is what else is is stayed from permanently bar barring defendants weisberg and mcconnell from serving the financial control of any new york corporation similar business entity so that means they can operate in New York. And similarly, the, the order barring defendants Trump, Weisman McConnell from serving as an officer director of any New York corporation for three years, that's not affecting him right now. That's stayed. Barring defendant Trump and the corporate defendants from applying for loans from New York financial institution for three years, they can borrow the money now. And that's a big deal. That's a very big deal. Because when you talk about what's considered a New York financial institution, I mean, I think there's a lot of financial institutions which have at least one branch in New York. So that could be a pretty broad, that's a pretty broad brush. You're going to struggle to find very many serious banks that are not, don't have any locations in New York. And five, barring defendants Donald Trump and, and Jr. and Eric Trump from serving as an officer director of any New York corporation in New York for two years. So this is all stayed as long as you pay. Take him, not pay, make an undertaking in the amount of $175 million. And again, if he wins on appeal, and they say this whole case is stupid and goes in the toilet, and he gets his money back. But he needs to come up with $175 million. And they said that uh, the aforesaid stay is conditioned on defendant appellants perfecting the appeals for September 2024 term of this court. What that means is they filed a notice of appeal. Your time, you have time then to perfect the appeal. 
perfecting the appeal is basically where you create a formal record. There's a whole formal process. Normally you go to an appellate press because the publishing on this is very complicated. It's very complicated. So they're actually um, printing agencies, which you call them up and you say, you know, I have appeal and this is the, this is the appellate number that I'm dealing with. And I want you to handle the publishing for me. And they, they take care of basically creating the entire record and putting it together and putting it and they walk you through the whole process. They're very, very helpful, very helpful. So, but it's expensive. I mean, it's going to it cost, you know, several thousand dollars just on the appellate press, but uh, they're very, very helpful as far as getting you what you need and making sure everything is properly and timely filed. So, um, so all of that step of writing your brief and making out your legal arguments, that's called perfecting the, and then having it filed, which like I said, normally it's a printing agency, which is going to do that. So all of that is called perfecting the appeal. The motion is, uh, usually you have like six to nine months to perfect it. You have a lengthy period of time to do all that. So you have to file your notice of appeal within 30 days. Your time to perfect the appeal is scheduled, is slated by the, the appellate court tells you when you have to get your briefs in and then they tell the other side when they have to get their opposition in by. But it's usually, you know, a good six months. The motion is always denied, including extending seeks a stay of enforcement of the portions of judgment, extending and enhancing the role of the monitor and directing the installation of independent director of compliance. Okay. This is a this is a fairly big win, especially because Trump says he has the money. Having the money makes this a huge win. We're going to get to that briefly in a moment because we're going to see that he got the money. Trump got paid. Trump got paid. Boy got paid. In fact, I'll just cover that really quickly before I get to his press meeting today. Trump's net worth jumps to $6.4 billion following the merger approval between True Social and Digital World Acquisition Corp. This could potentially close the fundraising gap in the 2024 presidential campaign between Trump and Biden. Will this make a difference? Oh, hell yeah. Making him one of the world's 500 richest people. Well, there you go. There's your president. There's your president. You know, I got to tell you something. I got to tell you something. I saw him posting on True Social. I'm like, dude, give it up. No one cares about True Social. No one cares about True Social. That man knows business a hell of a lot better than I do. Hell of a lot better. You know what I said to this? And you all said, just stop mean tweeting. Yeah. It's time for us all to accept that when it comes to making yourself rich and powerful, he really does just know better than we do. He does. He does. If you think you have a better clue how to make yourself rich and powerful than Donald Trump, I have, I have two words for you. You're an idiot. <laughs> it's that simple. It's that simple. Those are my two words. You're an idiot. Okay? You're an idiot. Because everyone has been screaming, just stop the mean tweets. No, no. That guy turned mean tweets into him. He's supposed to be making on, on this three to three and a half billion dollars. Yeah, he knows what he's doing. Hell a lot better than you or I do. Hell a lot better. So now he's not able to use that money for up to like six months, which they say means encumbering it. When he gets the money is another question. Also, like when the stocks come into his name, he's normally what wealthy people do is they'll take when they have big plots of stock, they can use that and get a loan and use his collateral. So you can get, you know, take $3 billion worth of stock and get a loan for a billion, billion and a half, two billion, because they feel pretty confident it's not going to lose, you know, two thirds of its value overnight. So that's so that's what a lot of wealthy people do. That's what Elon Musk does. He's supposedly not allowed to do this contractually during the first six months. But likely there's ways for him to help waive that. Like all he probably would need to do to help waive that, I don't know if it's contractually bound to do this, is if he just promises not to tweet on Twitter and to keep on true social. 
because that's what gives it its value. That's what gives it its value. So, I don't know, maybe you made that, made that commitment already. I don't know. But that is what he's the one who gives it its value. All right. Now, I also want to get to his his presser and then move on to Puff Diddy. But did you sing Mocking Your Cousin? Was it filmed? If yes, share. It was filmed. I was not mocking my cousins. No, no, no. I would not do that. I don't mock people. It might have been somewhat lampooning a little bit. Some, some, of my, um, some, it, it was really, it was, it was a song that was, uh, basically fixating on how the Purim party that I and my nephews really love, how it's really not all gravy for their wives. So it was really looking at their side of the coin. Their perspective on it. Do you have demurs in New York where Trump could say, even if all the facts alleged are true, there's no crimes, the case must be dismissed? There are. There is such a thing. I don't practice criminal defense, so I don't know um, how that. Is. I mean, that's that's a legal concept, which I know that they. Um, I mean, I, that, that that's a, that's a legal concept. I'm sure that there's some sort of. Of, of element to that normally you would think that that would have been addressed before they would go to trial so clearly the judge seems to respect that this is a valid basis in law to go after him whether that will survive appeal is an interesting question also because i don't understand it the new york appellate court wants to see if they want to go down this road did the government pay twitter and facebook hush money for what they <laughs> deemed misinformation on the apple airplane i don't know i don't know i don't know but the point is, there's nothing illegal about it. Anytime you go and meet a, a new company that, or someone comes in and pitches an idea to you that they want you to help in, they're going to have you sign an NDA. That's part of the business. That's part of, like, everyone signs NDAs all the time. And that's a hush money. If you're getting any compensation at all, that's hush money. Everyone knows this. Oh, you're too kind, George. Oh, my friend George the Giant Slayer. God bless. I'm going to drop a little horn on you. Thank you for stopping in here, George. You're awesome. Thank you, thank you so much, my friend. If you're not signed up to George Giant Slayer, you should check him out. Dude does great work, and I, uh, I made an appearance on his channel a week ago, and I think I'm going to be making a bunch more in the near future. So he's awesome. He has panels of based, base panels. He covers a lot of the, um, a lot more of the entertainment industry. But he has very base takes, and you're going to like him. Engoron gave summary judgment because he found Mar-a-Lago was only worth $18 million. Trump's experts value it much higher. Since there's a material dispute of facts, would court throw out summary judgment? Yes and no. Yes and no. There's a lot. There are a lot of legal bases. There are a lot of legal issues with the way Engoron handled his case. So, for example, to me, some of the key elements that he will be bringing up in his brief, and I'm sure he'll bring this up, is the Judge Engeron took what he called, he called his, um, I don't know, he called it a waiver, but it's not really a waiver. But basically, attached to his financial documents was what's really a disclaimer, saying, don't rely on the numbers I'm giving you, do your own due diligence which is something that every borrower to banks who uses real estate collateral signs, they all sign it and they all rely on it. And it's almost known that you're going to be bumping your numbers up somewhat and that there's some speculation here, which is why they sign that. Because obviously it's almost like, you know, when people go in and they make a resume before they go in to an employer, you want to make your assets look as pretty and as fancy and as wealthy as you possibly can. So you're going to be looking at it with very rosy glasses. That's, and you don't want anyone to say, well, I relied on you. So Judge Engeron said, yeah, okay, normally that works. Normally that's okay, but not when you include information that only you as the owner can have. 
You, the owner, have access to this information. No one else could have it. And since you know they could not have it, you know they are relying on you. And when you mislead them, you can't just use a disclaimer and say, I disclaim, not my fault. They should have known when you knew they couldn't know. So if you want to accept that this legal theory makes sense, and there is logic to, to, to that argument, okay, all right. Well, then let's look at what was presented at trial. That was so fraudulent, so terrible. What was he so deceitful about that they never could have known? And this is the way he conducted the trial, which showed that he came in with one legal perspective and then conducted the trial as if he wasn't depending on that legal perspective. Specifically, he said, well, you defrauded them when you said that when you implied that this, this had a certain number of floors more than what it had. Now, if he didn't have the disclaimer, you can say, okay, well, that's pretty classic fraud. You told him X, and, and when it was really much less than X, that's fraud. Well, then we have a disclaimer. So why do we knock the disclaimer away? The reason we're ignoring the disclaimer is because you're hiding information that they could not access. You're going to tell me that the number of floors in a building is something they couldn't figure out? That Trump alone has access to an active building? An active building? where people are going in and out of it every single friggin' day, and you're telling me that they couldn't figure it out? You could find out in 10 seconds and Google how many floors are there. So if he said, if he comes along, he says Trump Tower is, is, is 400 stories tall, and you're telling me, well, he tricked them. There's no way they could have known it wasn't 400 stories tall. I don't know, maybe the fact that there's no building in the earth, which is 400 stories tall, maybe that should be, that could be a clue for you. Maybe a little search on Google, which says that it's 55 or 57 stories tall. Maybe that could have been a clue for you. So you can't, on the one hand, say, I'm allowing this case to survive because there may have been facts that he alone had access to and then make the entire trial about facts that everybody had access to. How many units were built up on his property in Scotland? This is something you check land records. You do a flyover. In a helicopter. This is not something that you have to like sit there like you're like your freaking inspector gadget or James Bond and just go flying in there on some zip line so you can figure out how many units got in Scotland for crying out loud. I mean, I mean, this is this is basic stuff. You're telling me they can have no estimation as to what property is worth. He alone, on one hand, he says that he alone has access to what property is worth, as if Zillow doesn't exist. I mean, it's just, it's, it was asinine. It was asinine. It made no sense. So, yeah. The theory standing on its own could make sense. But when you take the theory he used to get to trial, and then you look at the information he allowed at trial to reach his conclusions that there was fraud, that doesn't make any sense to me. So I do not think for a second that a good faith court can come to conclusion that this is actually, that there's logic here as to how this court was conducted. This makes zero sense. So, yeah, that's that's my take on it. Should require a full account of where the $175 million goes. Normally, the undertaking goes to the court. It doesn't go, it doesn't go to the, it goes to the court. The court holds on to it. So, yeah, it's not something that they just give. They don't give it to the creditor. So, um, <clears throat> okay. Before I move on from this topic, I wanted to share with you Trump's statement today. We'll hear from the man himself in the wake of these court findings. So today, what he heard in court was he got a decision from the appellate court, which said it, cut it down to 175 million. And he also heard that his trial, which he was hoping would be starting on June June 24th, June 25th, is going to be starting April 15th. Well, I shouldn't have a trial. This is not a trial. This is not a an act of criminality. Yep. But you are having one. So do you I don't know if we're having one. We're going to be appealing right now. I can tell you that. Uh, we did nothing wrong, just like I did nothing wrong in the other case. 
my statements, my financial statements were conservative. They were low, not high. He's going back to the civil. I mean, he valued Mar-a-Lago at a tiny fraction of what it is. He's the fraud. He created a fraud in order to help his narrative and her. That's the other thing to answer your question, Ed, by the way, when you were asking about questions of facts, I didn't fully answer your question. So the one other thing I would mention is that you, a judge cannot reach a conclusion that is unsubstantiated by fact and law. If it's, there is a standard of, you know, we, if there's, um, that can be reviewed for, for clear error. Now, there's a lot of deference that's given to the judge, but it, it's not about the, t this is not, this is mostly paper. This is not based on testimony. You can look at paperwork and figure out, you know, whether the number that he's assigning, the 18 million number he's assigned to it, has any legitimacy in law, given all the facts of the circumstance. The judge relied on his perspective that because of the zoning, that that automatically now strips Mar-a-Lago of, I don't know, 50, 90% uh, of its value, which is a joke. It's a joke. As he explained at trial, why that's a joke. And the judge just said, I don't care. Because of the zoning, I'm, I'm basically pretending that this is not a residence and accordingly I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give it a... Um, uh, a joke value and Trump pointed out is like no, it makes it more valuable by because I made it that way, because I set it up the way I set it up because he set up as a club and something that's a club zoned as a club is something that has a much lower tax rate. So compared to my neighbors there, I'm paying much much less in taxes and I have the right under Florida law to live there still and have a club for one person. So I actually figured out a phenomenal loophole. In Florida law, which means that I'm paying lower taxes, and however you would rate other properties around me, neighboring properties around me, because they're paying much, much, much higher annual taxes, and I found this loophole and took advantage of it, my property is actually worth more than theirs. It's a better value to you. It's true. But the judge trying to like, aha, you see, because clubs are, it's like so stupid. I mean, it's just, it just defies logic. And usually courts are not too comfortable with think with decisions that defy logic. Like, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Narrative, because he does whatever she wants. And the judge is really, what he's done is fraudulent. He made Mar-a-Lago, you know it very well, Maggie. He made Mar-a-Lago into... 18 million dollars. I had many offers. They said, I'll give you 19. Okay. <laughs> you could take the half of the living room is worth more than that. So it's worth anywhere from 50 to 100 times that amount. And he stays with it. So he's either whacked out or dishonest, one or the other, or both, probably both. But he's a disgrace to the system. And I think that New York State was helped a lot today by the decision. I'll give you an example. Uh, Truth Social is doing very well. It's hot as a pistol and doing great. And it's going public. And the New York Stock Exchange wants to have us badly. And I told them, we can't do the New York Stock Exchange. You're yep. treated too badly in New York. You're crazy. We don't want to do the New York crazy Stock enough. Exchange. And the people at the Stock Exchange are very, very upset about it. The top person is, is mortified. Can't believe it. He said, I'm losing business because of New York, because people don't want to be in New York and they don't want to go into the New York Stock Exchange. Why would they want to? So you can ask oh, them about oh, it. But, you know, how can you do that? I'd love to go in the New York Stock Exchange. It was always, you know, it would be a big thing to go in the New York Stock Exchange. That'd be nice. But people aren't going in the New York Stock Exchange now because of what's happening in New York, because they don't want to be attacked by a thug like this horrible attorney general that we have in New York, the worst in the whole country. So we'll decide about Truth Social and what we do with it. But there's a, just an example of how this is hurting New York and New York State. Yes. The ticker is supposed to be DJT, his initials for Truth Social. DJT. DJT. I don't know how Truth Social becomes DJT other than the fact that, let's face it, it's all about DJT. Can you imagine? Can you imagine these leftists like running a ticker which has DJT going across the board? <laughs> ah, so good so good speaking of so good here real patriots party sent a rant talking about this crime that has been charged with in new york saying joe this is not a crime type of crime 
There are no lawyer sacrifices, no defendants, no judges, no courtrooms, no bailiffs, only witnesses. But it's definitely not a crime type of crime. Great. That was that was genius. That was very insightful, RPP. Really good. Really good. A little bit more detail about the timing of when you plan to secure the bond and how exactly you're planning to pay the bond. Well, as I say, I have a lot of cash. You know I do because you looked at my statements. I mean, you've been examining my statements for a long time, and I have much more than that in cash. But I would also like to be able to use some of my cash to get elected. They don't want me to use my cash to get elected. They don't want that. They don't want me taking cash out to sure. use it for the campaign. That's what it's about. And they looked at it, and this judge looked at it, and he's part of the whole deal. And why well, he's such a and that's what AOC herself said. She said it's right to take his money just so it's harder for him to run. I mean, this is this is what this is Congress really cares about justice. They care about democracy. They're all about democracy, very much about democracy. Disgrace for this city. Again, the most overturned judge. There's never been that we can find a, a case where a judge has been overturned now five times. It was four times. Now it's five times been overturned. But I have a lot of cash and a great company. I mean, to think they want to go after a company. This is a great company, a company that's doing very well. I've got very low debt on buildings like this building. I have very low debt on this building. Uh, most buildings, I have no debt. This was at 40 Wall Street he was at. Most clubs, I have no debt. You took, look at my greatest assets. I have no debt. I didn't even include like brand value. And the brand value is I became president because of the brand, let's say. But the brand value is it's one of the most valuable brand values. So I think it's I wouldn't swap it for any other brand in the world. Trump. I don't even put anything down for it. I had very conservative statements. And the way they made him look bad is by valuing Mar-a-Lago at $18 million instead of what the real value is, which was at least 50 to maybe 100 times more. Think of that. This is the fraud. They're creating a fraud and they're hurting the state so badly. And then I can't go into the New York Stock Exchange because I can't do business because I don't want to do Not because I can't, because I don't want to do business in New York. And the people at the New York Stock Exchange, I can tell you right now, and they're very fine people. They're not happy. Yeah. Very fine people. Some some very fine people on the stock exchange. Some very, very fine people. Not everyone. Not all of them are fine people. But on the New York Stock Exchange, there's some very fine over there. They got some very fine people over there. <laughs> you gonna say Mr. President, Mr. President, you mentioned the cash you have. You said on Friday it's something like five hundred million. You intend yeah. to put some of that into the campaign. Now that the bond's been reduced, are you gonna start putting money into your campaign? Yeah. You haven't done that since yeah. twenty sixteen. Well, first of all, it's none of your business, I mean frankly. But uh, I might I might do that. I have the option. But if I have to spend five hundred million on a bond, I wouldn't have that option. I'd have to start selling things. I don't have to sell anything because I'm a, it's a phenomenal company. Look, I built a phenomenal company. Someday they'll actually report that. I built a phenomenal co company that's very low leverage, unbelievably low leverage with a lot of cash, a lot of everything else. Why should I let a crooked judge make a decision to give $450 million? That allows me to spend very little money on my campaign if I so choose. I'll be spending money on my campaign. I might spend a lot of money on my campaign, but I should have that option. A crooked judge shouldn't say, we're going to have you post a bond and take all of that money that I could be spending on a campaign or other things if I want to do other things. So we were gratified. By because it's my money. It's my freaking money. This is ridiculous. This whole thing is so insane. By the professionalism of the opinion today, I thought it was a very, I think it's a very important opinion for New York, but, uh, the only thing that's going to really solve that problem is when I win, because you're going to have to win, because no company is going to be coming to New York if I don't win that case. That case is a scam, it's a sham, and it's a hoax. How does this work? Do you ever accept money from a foreign government to pay the bond or your fines or anything? No, I don't. I don't do that. I mean, I think you'd be allowed to possibly. I don't know. I mean, if you go borrow from a big bank, many of the banks are outside of this. As you know, the biggest banks, frankly, are outside of our country. So you could do that, but I don't need to borrow money. I have a lot of money. I have a lot of, I built a great company, but I don't want to have a crooked judge named Ngoran and a crooked, horrible, the worst, the worst, uh, 
I would say without question, attorney general in the country, the most obnoxious and the worst attorney general in the whole country. And she did it for political reasons. Go back and take a look at her ads. We will stop Trump. Well, she knows nothing about me. I never heard of her. She was advertising and she took ads in saying, we will stop Trump. We will stop him. Stop him. Vicious. I said, boy, that's a bad one. Then I looked, she got elected. But then she tried to do it with the governor and it didn't work. She went after the current governor, who's much more talented than she is. She went after the current governor. She was very nasty. And she polled at about 3%. She polled at nothing. And after six weeks or seven weeks, she pulled out of the race. She ran for governor, you know, on what she was doing to me. She thought that would work. It didn't work. Uh, I just think that it's very important that, you know, this is a time when businesses have a choice to go to a lot of places, including other countries. They don't have to stay in our country, but they can certainly go also to a lot of other states. A lot of people are going to Texas, Florida, Tennessee. And New York is already struggling. New York is already struggling. This is like, you know, New York has been struggling for a while. They've been struggling ever since COVID. It's been, things been bad. A lot of people, a lot of these buildings are half empty because you don't need to go into the office. And and here's here's the thing. You know, one of the things that they brought up in the spaces I was on today was that um, it's a car payment. Your monthly travel bill is hundreds of dollars, hundreds of dollars. If you, if you, you know, don't live in Manhattan, it's hundreds of dollars. And they got this crazy new tax to basically keep out anyone from coming into New York. It's insanity. It's insanity what they what they're doing there. And they 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 they're ruining the city. They're ruining it. So yeah. Yeah. North Carolina, a lot of South Carolina, and you have a lot of competition. You shouldn't be persecuting people that have done a great job. I paid $300 million approximately over the years in taxes here. $300 million. That's a lot of money. And you're going to lose those people that pay all that money. And you're not even going to have a state anymore. They just won't be able to do it. Yep. Back to the crowd here in three weeks. Do you plan to testify? And are you concerned? The which, which hearing? The trial hearing. I don't know that you're going to have the trial. I don't know how you can have a trial like this in the middle of an election, a presidential election. And this is, again, this is a Biden trial. These are all Biden trials because Colangelo worked for Biden. Can you imagine they take a guy out of DOJ and they put him into the attorney general's office and then into the Manhattan DA's office to go after Trump? These are all Biden trials. So I don't know that you're going to have it. I think we're going to get some court rules. I love how he refers to himself as a third person. And it doesn't sound weird when he says it. It's like they put these people in the DOJ's office to go after Trump. <laughs> Jimmy's got to move. Jimmy's going to score. Jimmy's going to take it to the hole. <laughs> I think you like Jimmy. Yeah, but will you testify if that trial goes forward? I would have no problem testifying. I didn't do anything wrong. And would you be concerned that a conviction, if you are convicted, could cost you the election given what Todd said voters are well it could also make me more popular because the people know it's a scam it will a hundred percent make him much more popular much more popular I know I know it's it's, it's gonna it's gonna make some of your skin crawl um, some of you have your skin crawl from this I'm telling you right now I'm telling you right now if they have this trial in three weeks which a I will be live streaming it, and I don't know that they'll allow. They're going to be allowing cameras in there. If they're not allowing cameras in there, I will be going down to the courthouse to give you live updates, and I will be reporting. And I'm going to go in there, and I got my, uh, I got my, I got my, I got my attorney ID. I got my media press badge. I'm going to be in there, and I'm going to be, I'm going to be sharing with you everything that's going on there with my completely unfiltered take. So, um. Yeah, that's starting April fifteenth. I I think it's going to go forward on April fifteenth. I think we're, I think it's going to be April fifteenth. Damn, it's a Biden trial. This is a Biden. There is no trial. There's a Biden trial. Colangelo, the man who stood up, had the nerve to actually stand up and take over. You know, he's been sitting in the background for the last year. Today he went right up front because they figure he buffaloed the whole public and the writers, including you people. He got a buffalo. They forgot. They didn't. You know. Look little while ago time time sort of people forget with time they don't have good memories i do 
They don't have good memories. But Colangelo from the DOJ was put there to go after Trump. And today he stood up and he took over the whole office. He's been running the whole thing. He's been signing the letters. He's been doing things for a long time. Nobody's ever seen anything like it. This is all done by the Democrat Party, and it's all done by Biden and his group. I don't know if it's Biden, because I don't know if Biden is even sharp enough. I don't know if Biden knows what's happening. You want to know the truth. Maybe he does. <laughs> he he does. probably does. He does. But this is all done by Biden and the thugs that work for Biden. And it's a very bad thing. It's a very dangerous thing for our country. Thank you all very much. Thank you. There he goes. There he goes. Walking off into the sunset. Well, at least for today. So, Chugi saying, didn't occur to me it could be traded and not be on the New York City Stock Exchange. Also, Candace is ignorant and Diddy is not hiding in the tunnels. Yeah, I'm not weighing in on the whole Candace and Shmuley Botea thing. I saw his perm costume. I was, like, revolted. I, I Everything, I, I, just, I don't even want it. I, it's like, I just can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't keep track of all the things she says. I can't keep track of, of all the things he says. I, can't, I, I just, like, to me, that drama is boring. I actually posted on X my perspective about the difference between, you know, when people are talking about Jews, the easy line as to whether it's completely a, a very moral thing to do or an immoral thing to do. And I think I made it pretty clear there. So I'm not going to be, uh, you know, then people can, it's a, and it's a, it's a pretty standard line, which would apply to any race, really. Um, Stephen Cooper gifting five. Good logic memberships. God bless you, brother. And uh, let's see. Who is it that owes you a debt of gratitude? Oh, my goodness. Linda Richards gifted a membership by Stephen Cooper. Linda Richards. <laughs> now a member of the following. Uh, Lord Doom, Howie Brown, Caustic Chameleon, and Dog Backwards. All gifted memberships by Stephen Cooper. Wow. Wow. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very, very, very much. All right. <laughs> yes, that one. That one. That, the, the same. The same. There you go. Okay. We should get to Puffy. I missed you, scroll longer. I you didn't get it. You didn't look into it. You didn't look into it. I read off all the ones who got who 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 were blessed by Stephen. So thank you, Stephen. You're awesome. Um, all right, let's get into P. Diddy. We'll give you the overall story first, and then we'll do some speculating. We'll do some speculating. Let's start with the story. Sean Diddy Combs' home is raided by law enforcement as part of an investigation report says. This was uh, over the last several hours. Two of Sean Diddy Combs' home were reportedly searched by U.S. Homeland Security on Monday as part of a federal investigation. What were they looking for? We don't know. We don't know. What was the warrant based on? What purported crimes? We don't know. All we do know is that it's Homeland Security. Not the FBI or some, you know, special victims unit of the FBI. Not, not, it was Homeland Security, which makes it feel like there's something having to do with people crossing the border. Right? I mean, Homeland Security. But federal officials raided Combs' Los Angeles home Monday, according to Rolling Stone, local Los Angeles news station Fox 11, amid lawsuits filed against him from accusers alleging the rapper music mogul has. Ard or essayed them. So I don't know how they I don't know how they know that. Agents also search Combs Miami residence Monday Rolling Stone. How do they know that? How do they know that it has to do with this? And I'm not saying it's not that. You would think that would be FBI though. That wouldn't be Homeland Security if it was just, you know, your, you know, forgive, forgive my my description, your garden variety essay. 
which as heinous and gross and disturbing and oh my gosh punish them please anyone who actually does that sort of thing um that's just not the ter terrain of homeland security normally unless there's another wrinkle that's thrown in there agents also searched Combs miami residence monday um was reported by rolling stone nbc news and the ap it's unknown whether the rapper himself was present during the raids well when reached for comment regarding a case on Combs, a Homeland Security Investigations spokesperson said in a statement to USA Today Monday that Homeland Security Investigation, New York, executed law enforcement action as part of an ongoing investigation with assistance from HSI LA, HSI Miami, and our local law enforcement partners. We will provide further information as it becomes available. Well, you know, some information you could provide that is available is what is crimes are you investigating? That would be something you could, that you know already. <laughs> Fox 11 aired helicopter footage of law enforcement on the grounds of what is purportedly Combs LA residence and videos armed agents are seen outside and roaming around the Hollenby Hills mansion in West LA police department vehicles and officers appear to have cordoned off the residential street for to onlookers per video footage. Do you have the video footage here? Cause I saw it. it's like a minute and a half long. Well, let's go a little further here. I'll we'll see if I can dig that up for you. US Today reached out to reps to come to comment <clears throat> per NBC News, LA Times, and AP. The searches are part of an ongoing sex trafficking investigation in New York. Several people have been interviewed by investigators about allegations against Combs regarding sex trafficking, assault, and other alleged offenses, according to NBC News and the AP. The Bad Boy Records founder is facing multiple lawsuits filed in recent months claiming the music local had art or essayed several alleged victims over the past few decades. Most recently, a music producer who worked with Combs on his most recent record, the Love Album Off the Grid, sued him in February, accusing him of engaging in serious illegal activity, including SA. I actually have a copy of that that was shared with me over here, which is Ronnie Jones versus Sean, Go Sean Combs and all these other defendants in a civil action filed in the Southern District of New York. We'll do, we'll do a quick glance through that shortly. An anonymous accuser filed a lawsuit in December alleging Combs and his associates arred her when she was 17 years old, which, by the way, in New York, at least, that would not be statutory. The, 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 the age, not that that's really re relevant when you're talking about a woman being forced anyway, but uh, the age of consent in New York is 17. Previous month, <clears throat> a woman named Joy Dickerson Neal filed a lawsuit against Combs, alleging she was drugged, essayed, and abused, and was the victim of revenge porn. So this sounds like, you know, another Cosby situation here. Several days before this, his ex-girlfriend, singer Cassie Ventura, accused Combs of RS traffic physical abuse. Combs and Cassie settled for an undisclosed amount a day later. Lawsuits filed by Dickerson, Neil, and Ventura were done so before the New York Adult Survivors Act deadline. It gave victims of SA a one-year window to make claims that would otherwise be barred by time limits. This is the law that was resurrected by or created by Kathy Hockle with the sole objective, the stated objective, of enabling E. Jean Carroll to go after Donald Trump. So but you can't really write it would be a problem with habeas corpus for them to say you're allowed to sue donald trump for the next year so instead they said you can sue anyone we're doing away with statute limitations as a defense for the next year um for any of those crimes and sean and p diddy got caught up in this now i'm not saying that's you can speculate whether it's a good thing or a bad thing but Combs has denied all accusations against him. Douglas Wigder, lawyer for Cassie Vendura and Jane Doe, shared a statement Monday afternoon after reports of the search warrant on Combs emerged. Quote, we will always support law enforcement when it seeks to prosecute those that have violated the law, Wigder said. Hopefully this is the beginning of a process that will hold Mr. Combs responsible for his depraved conduct. Attorney Tyrone Blackburn, who represents some of Combs' accusers, told Rolling Stones, about damn time! Sometimes justice delayed is not justice denied, so long as justice ultimately arrives. So there you go. Why is it people are all speculating that this is all about his uh, 
that these that this whole investigation is of a sexual nature well that's because of this complaint right here filed by rodney jones i'm going to do a quick look, look, read through for that of that in a moment in a moment um you emailed me an age comparison of count trump count trump i don't know what that means count trump Uh, it's gonna be difficult for me to go to now. If Puffy is arrested, he and R. Kelly could form a supergroup called Piddles. <laughs> That's pretty funny. That's pretty funny. Four Seasons says, RIP to the NYPD officer that gave his life protecting New York City today. Suspect had 21 prior arrests. New York State is trash. It is. It is. It's a real shame. I grew up there. Fond memories. Fun memories. It never looked good when the defense is he's not technically a PDF. <laughs> it does not. That's not a good look in general. That's true. Sherry, remember for four months. Four months, Sherry. The following is not at all a cult type of cult. So, yeah. Fun fact, Brown spelled backwards is... I don't know what that means. <laughs> oh, N word. Like it's literally N word because the B becomes a D. <laughs> I thought we were going to a dark place. I thought we were going to a dark place. I was very scared. I was having flashbacks. I was having flashbacks. Exuviate says, here's a link to the flight tracking of Diddy's private jet, which took off shortly before the raid and just landed Antigua a little while ago. Oh, okay, cool. I appreciate you sharing that. This is what everyone is all... Um, he's being called now, you know, P. Diddler. And everyone's very excited watching his, his, his plane. Here's his little plane. And the route that it's been going since he's basically been on the run in a plane that's called like the Ford Bronco or something. Yeah, I wonder how they didn't have to refuel at a certain point. That's a long flight. This is a long flight. Look at this flight. From L.A., Antigua. People were speculating that he was going to be heading to Cabo Verde over here across the Atlantic. I don't know that he could have made it to Cabo Verde without refueling. That looks like a long flight. So there he is. He's being tracked. I believe Antigua is not a jurisdiction which has extradition. Now, I saw someone up there said that he's turned him. He's been he's in custody, but I don't see that anywhere. I don't see that anywhere. So if any of you have knowledge that he's he is in custody, I'd be curious for your source for that. I think midair refueling that's possible. Maybe his plane is electric. <laughs> so. Let's look a little bit more at the claims and allegations against Mr. Uh, look at that. The claims and allegations against him. Mm. 
All right. Nice. Nice. See, I understand what you mean by on the hoof. It's a reference to being like some of you younger folk might not realize it's a younger, it's a reference to to um being on the run i'm very curious and i'm making a poll about this because i was very bothered yesterday one more thing i want to show you this is over in locals this is pretty funny <laughs> that was pretty funny trump like sort of waving trump tower in front of in front of her gotta do better than that almost had it gotta do better <laughs> Maybe in front of that fish. That was pretty good. So am I the only one? I, ha, I'm just wondering, like, how old you have to be to know the word blotto? Because I used it in my song yesterday. Apparently, everyone under 30 had no idea what the word meant. So I'm actually going to put a poll up here because I'm wondering if I was crazy for assuming that everyone would know what the word blotto means. I need to know. I need I need answers to this question. So, so you're my audience. So I'm gonna have start a poll. And it's really meant for people who are under 30. Do you no no So I'm going to That is I that I is tight. He left three hours before the raids. Yeah, that's what I heard. I heard also, Pam. I heard the same thing. I don't get it. Let's look at these claims against P. Diddy. I'm not gonna go through this entire thing because this is 73 pages and it would take me four hours to do that. But we're gonna go through some of the um the main the main sections of this just to get a feel for what this is about. So <clears throat> this is little Rodney or Little Rod Jones. I wonder who gave him the name Little Rod. All right, Little Rod Jones hereby <laughs> Mr. Jones hereby alleges as and for his complaint against defendant Sean Combs, which is P. Diddy's real name, defendant Justin D. R. Combs. Defendant Lotion Charles Grange and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, 
I get a jurisdiction and venue. This is filed in the Southern District of New York. And he says, Plaintiff Ronnie Jones is an American artist, music producer. Jones resides in the states of New York and California. Sean Combs is a rapper and record executive, popularly known by his stage names Puff Daddy, Puff, Puffy, P. Diddy, Diddy, brother, brother Love or Love. Mr. Combs came to fame in the early 1990s with his record label Bad Boy Records, rose to prominence in music and entertainment industries over the decades, regularly referred to as hip-hop mogul. Mr. Combs resides at 200 South Mapleton Drive, Beverly Hills. And there he is. Not really looking that great in this picture. Defendant Justin Dior Combs, as the son of Mr. Combs and Miss and Misa Hilton, Jay Combs was born on December 30th, 1993. Jay Combs is a producer and actor, appeared on TV series like Catfish, the TV show Wild and Out, and Hip Hop Squares. Fan Justin D.R. Combs resides at 1515 North El Centro Ave, L.A. Defendant Lucian Charles Grange, CEO of Defendant Universal Music Group. Lucian Charles Grange also lives in California. There he is. Defendant Ethiopia Habtamarium is the former CEO of Defendant Motown Records, parent company of Defendant Love Records. Habtamarium resides in California. Then you got Krista, Christina Corum, who is residing in California. Defendant Chalice Recording Studios and Motown and Universal and Love Records and Combs Global. All right. Jones is from Chicago, born and raised in Chicago, second oldest son, four child, nine siblings. Jones comes from a long line of gospel music influencers. Jones started playing instruments at the age of five. He began playing drums in church at the age of 13. He picked up and playing the guitar from 13 to present day, taught himself to play over 13 instruments. Wow. Jones considered a musical prodigy. His talents led, led, led him to produce and create a commercial marketplace for music that's been recorded by some of the most prestigious and highly acclaimed artists. And that's his whole background here. From September 2022 to November 2023, Jones produced nine songs on Mr. Combs' Love album. Jones lived with Combs for months at a time, spending holidays, birthdays, and missing major family events. Jones resided at Combs' residence located in L.A., California, New York City, and Miami. Jones also spent several weeks on a yacht rented by Mr. Combs in the U.S. Virgin Islands. Throughout his time with Combs, Jones witnessed, experienced, and endured many things that went far beyond his role as a producer on the Love album. The claims raised in this complaint have been corroborated through witness statements, video, audio recordings, and images that Jones has in his possession. So we got tons of, of evidence here. Combs required Jones to record him constantly. On several occasions, Combs took Mr. Jones' cell phone and began recording himself. As a result, Jones has secured hundreds of hours of footage and audio recordings of Combs, his staff, and his guests engaging in serious illegal activity. This is a pretty serious claim for someone to write in a complaint. Now, the phrase illegal activity is a conclusory statement. Because normally you would you would just spell out, like, we saw him distributing cocaine in quantities of greater than a kilo. You know, something like that. And that would basically be the elements of the crime rather than just saying he committed crimes. So... It's not something you people are very hesitant to put in conclusive. Most attorneys are very hesitant to put in conclusory language like this. The fact that this attorney put it in here, assuming that this attorney is someone who's, you know, got some sort of reputation, which they probably do, means they probably feel very confident that this is going to bear out. Jones has secured irrefutable evidence of the acquisition, use of distribution of ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, mushrooms, displaying and distribution of unregistered illegal firearms. Combs provided laced alcoholic beverages to minors and sex workers at his home in California, New York, U.S. Virgin, US Virgin Islands, and Florida. Combs' chief of staff, Christina Corum, instructing her sta staff to retrieve drugs so she can pick it. She can provide it to Combs for his consumption. This, I mean, she's making him sound like, like he's like a combination of Epstein and Elvis. Combs drugging and sexually assaulting a woman. Combs detailing how he planned to leverage his relationship with Bishop T.D. Jakes to soften the impact of his public Im image of Cat 
of Cassie Ventura's lawsuit. Young Miami's cousin and or assistant sexually assaulting Mr. Jones. Actor Cuba Gooding Jr. sexually harassing and assaulting Mr. Jones. Whoa. Whoa. Rapper redacted on Mr. Cohen's yacht consorting with underage girls. Working, who were working girls, R&B singer redacted in Mr. Combs' L.A. home consorting with underage girls and workers. Wow. 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 On about September 12, 2022, Combs held a writers and producers camp at Shalice Recording Studio in California. Present at this camp were Mr. Combs, his son Justin Combs, and Justin's friend named G. Mr. G is 30-year-old, tall, African-American male. In addition to this individuals, other musicians were present at the camp. Writer has spoken with several musicians who attended the camp. One evening during the camp, Combs, Jay Combs, and G were in a heated conversation. The conversation was moved out of the studio and in a restroom adjacent, adjacent to where Mr. Jones was sitting. Jones was approximately two feet away from the bathroom when gunshots rang out. Mr. Jones recalls hearing multiple gunshots. Jones immediately went to a state of shock and feared he would be shot next. Jones generally believed he was shot through the door due to how close he was. After the shooting ended, a crowd gathered around the restroom. When the door finally opened, Mr. Combs and Jay Combs exited. G was lying on the restroom floor in a fetal position, holding his stomach and bleeding out of his left leg hip area. Everyone stood around looking upon G. Frustrated by the lack of aid to G, Jones dropped everything, ran to G, and immediately began placing pressure on G's gunshot wound to his stomach. As he was applying pressure on his stomach, Jones realized that G was gushing blood from another area near his leg or hip. He decided to lift G and place him to sit in the toilet. Mr. Jones asked the crowd to call the ambulance. Jones lifted G and brought him to the ambulance at the studio's front. At this time, Combs and Justin, and Justin disappeared to another part of the studio. Combs gave strict instructions to inform the police that he had nothing to do with the shooting. He also forced Mr. Jones to lie to the police by telling them that G was shot standing outside the studio by a drive-by assailant. Wow. He's in trouble. He's he's in big-time trouble. They have, that's the... He's in serious trouble. Jones and several corroborating witnesses spoke with this writer anonymously due to fear of retaliation from Cones. They agreed to speak publicly when subpoenaed. Jones, as the clothing he wore that day, believes he may still have stains in DNA of G's blood. Following a screenshot of the aftermath of the restaurant where G was shot by either Mr. Combs or Jay Combs. We don't know. It was either he or his son. Either, Sean, either P. Diddy or his son shot G. Wow. Clearly, G was not shot outside the studio as Combs instructed the team to report to law enforcement. Combs and defendant LR, MR, UMG, and CRS provided private security for the writer's camp at the defendant CRS. Security was porous and lackluster at best. The fact that either Mr. Combs and Jay Combs were allowed to enter CRS with guns and those guns were not confiscated by security is a clear breach of duty by Mr. Combs, defendants LR, MR, and UMG to protect Mr. Jones and other attendees of the writer's camp. As a result of the shooting, Jones is severely traumatized. Jones now suffers from PTSD, severe anxiety, depression, and insomnia. Now let's talk about how he was sexually harassed and assaulted. Events that took place in LA, New York, and Florida. In addition, so he was the victim of constant unsolicited and unauthorized groping and touching of his anus by Mr. Combs. Wow. That was in L.A., New York, Florida, and the Virgin Islands. In addition to the unsolicited and unauthorized touching, Jones was forced by Combs to work in Mr. Combs' bathroom as Combs walked around naked and showered in a clear glass enclosure. As a heterosexual Christian man, Jones was uncomfortable with, with Combs' advances and expressed his discomfort to Combs' chief of staff, Christina Corum, who's aptly named KK. KK responded to Mr. Jones' plan with, you know Sean will be Sean. KK also attempted to downplay Combs' groping of Mr. Jones' anus and genitals as a friendly horseplay, saying those acts are Mr. Cohn's way of showing that he likes you. 
what is he like a dumb playful animal no he's nuzzling against your crotch because he likes you this this is just this is sick this is really sick despite these assurances on several occasions when combs began to undress and walk around his house kk would say okay i'm leaving now and she would disappear KK's hypocrisy is breathtaking at best or enabling at worst. Jones believes that KK aided and abetted Combs' sexual assault to him and was working with Combs to groom him into accepting a homosexual relationship. Through these sexually deviant acts, one would say Combs has a pattern and practice of engaging in such nefarious activity. This ongoing conduct shows Combs cannot be rehabilitated. He attempted to groom Go Jones into engaging in gay sex. Combs was aware that Jones looked up to an idolized music producer, Stephen Aaron Jordan, Stevie J, an American DJ record producer and television personality. Stevie J was part of the Bad Boy Records producer team, The Hitman. In 97, Stevie J won a Grammy Award with it for his work on Puff Daddy's debut album. Throughout the late 1990s, Stevie J produced for several artists, including Mariah Carey, Tevin Campbell, and Torres B.I.G., 112 Jodeci. Faith Evans, Jay-Z, and Eve. Stevie G was, was one of the producers on the Love Album. Combs used access to Stevie J and his knowledge of Mr. Jones' admiration of Stevie J to groom and entice him into homosexuality. He went so far as to share a video of Stevie J anally pen penetrating a Caucasian male without a condom. This was done to ease Mr. Jones' anxiety concerning homosexuality. According to Combs, this is an old practice in the music industry. Look, even Stevie J is doing it. This is sick. This is so sick. This is so. Combs informed Mr. Jones that he engaged in sexual intercourse with rapper, R&B singer, and Stevie J. Combs promised to make sure that Jones wins producer of the year of the Grammys if he engaged in homo. Wow. The following screenshots of the video of Stevie J anally penetrating a Caucasian male that comes with, I'm not even doing that. Not doing that. All right. Jones was sexually assaulted by young Miami's cousin. Mr. Jones was in Combs' house located in Miami, Florida. Young Miami and her female cousin were also present. Combs was intoxicated and offered cocaine to Jones. Jones rejected him and proceeded to walk to the restroom. While using the restroom, young Miami's cousin burst in the bathroom and began groping Mr. Jones. Jones believes that Mr. Combs sent her in there to sexually assault Jones. As she entered the bathroom, she dropped her knees and began performing oral sex on Mr. Jones' exposed penis. Jones pushed her away and exited the bathroom. Young Miami's cousin did not accept Mr. Jones' rejection. She proceeded to follow Jones out of the bathroom, started undressing, attempting to straddle him and have sex with him in the presence of Mr. Combs and his staff. Okay. There's no... All right, there's nothing. Okay. Throughout his time with Mr. Combs, Mr. Jones was transported from California to New York, Florida, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. During this time, Jones was forced to solicit sex workers and perform acts to the pleasure of Mr. Combs. On or about February 4, 2023, Combs forced Jones to bring prostitutes and workers back to his home in Miami. He's got a lot of evidence here. There's a ton of evidence. This is crazy. This is crazy. If they can't find Diddy, should they check the tunnels? As a firm and follower of our dear leader, you, I'm not the leader. Not the, the I don't know who told you that. I don't know who told you. I'm not the leader. I'm not the leader. I propose to build tree houses for our seances and communications with hell. What? <laughs> who? FYI, news from 11 20 23 notes she tried blackmailing him for 30 million, or she write a slanderous book and quotes her saying she's speaking up now because the New York Adult Survivors Act was about to expire. Okay. That's that's Cassie. This is now. This is this is now Rod Jones. On February second, twenty twenty three, incident Jones believes Combs drugged him. Jones recall waking up naked, 
dizzy and confused in the bed with two work sex workers and Mr. Combs. He also recalls aimlessly wandering around the house with no clothes on. On another occasion in Miami, Florida, on Thanksgiving night, 2022, Combs asked Mr. Jones and DeForest Taylor to enter the studio bathroom. He asked them for a $100 bill because he wanted them to do cocaine with him. Jones was scared, but luckily he didn't have a $100 bill, so Combs waited a little later to do coke with young Miami. Later that evening, he required Jones to solicit sex workers from Booby Trap on the river located at 3615 Northwest South River Drive, Miami. Jones did so, and Combs forced him to engage in unsolicited acts with these workers. Well, as part of Jones' sex worker recruitment tools, Combs provided Jones with an exclusive bad boy baseball cap and required him to wear it to booby trap on the river as a signal to any worker he approached Mr. Combs was in town and sent Jones to recruit them. <coughs> Jones had no desire to visit booby trap on the river. You know, Mr. Jones had no desire to solicit sex workers in booby trap on the river. Combs used his power and influence to intimidate and force Mr. Jones into soliciting sex workers from booby trap on the river. As detailed below, Combs used many tactics to maintain dominion control over Mr. Jones. Apparently, these workers were apparently these workers were accustomed to servicing Mr. Combs. We know that if that he is in town by the side of the bad boy's baseball cap, the following are Instagram profiles of two of the workers that Combs required Mr. Jones to listen and have sex with in his home in Miami. Jones had no desire to solicit or have sex with the individuals in the previous paragraph. Combs used his power and influence to intimidate and force Jones into soliciting and sleeping with these women. Following is the phone number of another sex worker that Combs required Jones to solicit him for. Wow. I mean, there's a lot of very, very important detail here. Very important detail, which makes it obvious you can't be making this stuff up, right? I mean, it's not just the pictures, but it's like, you know, the blood in the bathroom. He's got phone numbers that he's been calling. He supposedly has hundreds of videos hundreds of hours of videos and this this is crazy jones had no desire to solicit or have sex with the individuals in the previous paragraphs combs used his power and influence to intimidate and force jones into soliciting and sleeping with the individuals above he used many tactics to maintain dominion control of jones promised him a grammy for producer of the year for the love album Offered him $250,000 to purchase all the instruments he wanted. Promised him ownership of his $20 million property, One Star Island in Miami, Florida. Promised access to record label executives like defendants Lucian Charles Grange and Ethiopia had to marry him. Combs would often switch up his approach. He'd go from promising Jones the world to threatening Mr. Jones with physical harm. Combs threatened to eat Mr. Jones' face and inform Mr. Jones he's willing to kill his mother, Janice Combs, if he must, in order to get what he wants, so he wouldn't think twice to harm Mr. Jones. On about July 2nd, 2023, in California, Combs had a listening party at his home. President of the party were R&B artists, redacted, Jay Combs' sex workers, and some underage girls. This is craziness. This is crazy. Now the question is gonna the question that's gonna be thrown at him because he's gonna have to take the stand. This is a civil suit. In a civil suit, you can force either side to take the stand. Clearly, clearly Rodney little Rod Jones is gonna have to take the stand. And a large part of the questions that you can expect, assuming this does not settle, which good chance it will, but assuming it does not settle, a large part of the cross examination he's gonna be facing is why did you stay? It was that offensive that you wouldn't do it for $20 million. Why did you stay? Why did you stay? Why did you stay? The event began at 7 p.m. Combs requested female sex workers require Mr. Jones to solicit them. An hour later, several workers appeared. In addition to the sex workers, there were at least five women in the crowd that were under the age of 16. Combs forced all the women to drink laced de Leon liqueur. Upon information, belief, Combs laced the liquor with ecstasy. Combs did not check the identification of any of the underage girls. The presence of these underage women made Mr. Jones very uncomfortable. He attempted to leave, but Combs forced him to stay. Combs went so far as to take Jones' car keys to prevent him from leaving. After being forced to drink lace de Leon sh shots, Jones began feeling lightheaded and recalls passing out, waking up at 4 a.m. The, the, the following morning naked with a sex worker sleeping next to him. Screenshots of a video from the night is embedded below. Hold on a second. I got to be a little careful here. Yeah. Uh, 
family show. Jones believes that Combs was grooming him to pass off to his friends. This fear became a reality when Combs introduced Jones to Cuba Gooding Jr. while they were on Mr. Combs' yacht. During the introduction, Combs suggested that Cuba get to know Jones better, then left him alone in a makeshift studio on the yacht. So there you go. There's Jones and Cuba Gooding Jr. As evidenced by a video which screenshots are embedded below, Cooper Gooding Jr. began touching, groping, and fondling Mr. Jones' legs, his upper inner thighs, near his groin, the small of his back, near his buttocks, and his shoulders. I like saying buttocks, like, like Forrest Gump. Mr. Jones was extremely uncomfortable and proceeded to lean away from Mr. Gooding Jr., rejected his advances, and Mr. Gooding Jr. did not stop until Mr. Jones forcibly pushed him away. The following screenshot of the encounter with Cuba Gooding Jr. What the hell? Throughout his time with Mr. Combs, Jones was under an implied work for hire agreement. He was not compensated for his time living with Combs or for the songs he produced. As evidence, he was listed as a producer. For the following songs of the Love Album's final release, Deliver Me, Stay, PT, One, Reaching, What's Love, Stay, etc. Combs defendants LR, MR, and UMG all benefited from Jones' work product. They failed to compensate him for his work. As a result, Mr. Combs and defendants LR were all unjustly enriched at the expense of Jones. Jones attempted to work with Combs to secure his publishing and royalty rights for the work he completed on the Love Album. Mr. Combs only offered Mr. Jones $29,000 for 13 months, th thousands of hours of work, and nine songs that made it to the Love Album. Ironically, Mr. Jones is willing to take $50,000 his publishing and royalties. Mr. Combs' self-serving greed would not allow him to pay Mr. Jones an additional $21,000. Stupid. Stupid. So stupid. So stupid. So stupid. Wow. A perverse man who's also very stupid. So stupid. Combs' deceptive business practice became so bad that Jones was left with no choice other than to make a public plea on the social media for Combs to pay him for his work. After publicly requesting that Combs do the right thing and pay him fairly, Mr. Jones received an onslaught of threatening messages from Stevie J and Love Records and our DeForest Taylor. You playing? I'm in the studio. You're 100% Lair and Weirdo. Good luck. Number is still the same. Run into, come talk to me. Run into Binga. Come talk to me in public on a public podcast and forum. I don't know if that's threatening. I'm just being real here. I don't know if that's threatening. I said, come talk to me in public. That doesn't sound threatening to me, personally. Being real with you. How was Purim? We need a pick. Purim was awesome. It was awesome. I don't really have a pick on me here. I didn't really upload anything to my phone. But there's one in Locals. I put one in Locals. Normal in Hollywood land. Why I quit that career. Sorry, there's so much worse. He's the new target. Maybe. Maybe bias against men shouting me too, but it seems like a guy trying to distance himself from the dirt when the girls started talking. Just my two cents. Could be. It did he charge what will they freeze his assets? I don't know. His name isn't Trump, so who knows? Mr. Combs uses power and influence to threaten and intimidate Mr. Jones. According to Jones, Combs is very forceful and demanding. Combs does not take no for an answer, or often threaten to inflict bodily harm on Jones if Jones does not comply with his demands. As detailed above, Combs threatened to eat Mr. Jones' face. Another occasion, while standing in Mr. Combs' bedroom, Jones was forced to watch as Combs display his guns and bragged about getting away with shooting people. See, to me, that sounds like taken out of context. It really could be a, like a harmless nothing. Or maybe it wasn't designed to intimidate him. We don't know. We don't know. Combs shared that he was responsible for the shooting in the nightclub in New York City with rapper Shine. He shared that artist and Combs' girlfriend times Jennifer Lopez, a.k.a. J-Lo, carried the gun into the club for him and passed him the gun after he got into an altercation with another individual. There's J-Lo and P. Diddy. <coughs> the 
The shooting in Chalice recording studios confirm Mr. Combs' statements. Statements reinforce Mr. Jones' fear of Combs and strengthen Combs' dominion control of Jones. Jones, terrified, felt like he could not tell him no. Combs consistently made it clear that he has immense power in the music industry and with law enforcement. Combs made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. Bum, bum, bum. There's Fahim Muhammad. You don't want to get on the wrong side of Fahim. No one wants to get on the wrong side of Fahim. Why do you want to get on the wrong side of Fahim? He has the power to make people and problems disappear. That's what little that's what little Rod says Combs told him. Combs instructs his staff to always contact Mr. Muhammad if they're ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. Final information belief, Muhammad spoke with the LAPD after G was shot at CRS. LAPD were in CRS and witnessed the blood in the restroom, and they went with the bogus claim that the shooting of G occurred outside the studio. See, that? that's very freaky. That's very freaky. That's a very freaky thing. When you feel like the police are under the control of the guy who's over, that's very, that's the scariest part. That's much scarier than showing him guns or telling him, you know, your stories of shooting someone in a club. No, when you see that the police walk in, look around, and they're like, you know, they see blood all over the, the bathroom, like, oh, yeah, it totally looks like he was shot outside. That's scary because you feel helpless then. That's a real feeling of helplessness right there. All thanks to Mr. Muhammad's connections within law enforcement, Jones had no reason to disbelieve Mr. Combs as he had seen firsthand through the shooting of G and the subsequent silence of the LAPD and the media that Combs indeed had the power to harm him. LAPD spent hours in CRS after shooting a G, yet there were no arrests. Jones witnessed that the LAPD in the restroom picture above, yet no arrests were made. The morning after the shooting, Jones and several others arrived at CRS, and G's blood was still on the floor in the restroom. And Combs hired a cleanup crew to clean it up. All right. This is craziness, no? Okay. <laughs> everyone everyone thinks that they're they're the future in rap. I guess I guess drop barracuda is no exception. <laughs> wow. Wow. Miss Jones recalls seeing defendant Grange visiting Mr. Combs home in Miami, Florida at LA. According to Mr. Jones, whenever defendant Grange visited Combs at his house, it would be in the evening and he and Combs would disappear for hours in Combs' bedroom. Grange sponsored attended several love album listening parties at Mr. Combs' home in L.A. This parties were sponsored by defendants MR, LR, and UMG. As evidence above, these parties had sex workers, underage girls. During these parties, Grange knew or should have known that Mr. Combs was drugging the attendees through lace bottles of De Leon tequila and Ciroc vodka. It's no secret that Combs had specific bottles of alcohol designated for females and other bottles designated for his staff, his artist, and himself. This fact was detailed by former artists and bodyguards of Combs. As a sponsor of these events, Defendant Grange had a duty and obligation to ensure that sex workers and underage girls were not present and that Mr. Combs was not spiking the alcohol with date rape drugs. This guy sounds like a disaster, no? This is crazy. This is really crazy. On YouTube channel Art of Dialogue, former bodyguard Gene Deal exposed Combs' pill mixing method used to spank, sp spike cranberry juice and orange juice. According to Mr. Deal, Mr. Combs would place ecstasy and other date rape drugs in the juices. On YouTube, the Art of Dialogue, former artist Mark Curry exposed Mr. Combs spiking bottles of Moet Chappé in the, in the VIP. Of knife clubs. Mr. Combs would have set a Moe champagne bottles for ours and set of women. Should we check these links? When you was working for Diddy, right, how did he treat the people that was working for him? It depends on who it was. If you were a type of person that come a dime a dozen, you got treated like shit. 
if you was the type of person that he needed you, he treated you like sh If you was the type of person that he wanted you, he'll get you, and then he'll treat you like sh <laughs> If he wasn't fifth, if he wasn't fearful of you to a certain degree, he didn't give a shit how he treated certain people. Like Heavy D used to have to pull him to the side because somebody uh, give Heavy a call. And I don't know what. I still don't know today, and God bless the dead. I don't know what power Heavy D had over him. But Heavy D could come to his office. Heavy D could come to his house because when Heavy came to the city and Puff had the, a park, the, the, the building on 74th and Park Avenue, Heavy would stay in Puff building. But Heavy was the one like, Yo, come here, let me talk to you. And he would come right there. No back talk, no nothing. I don't know what power Heavy had on him, but he would never talk back or say no kind of crazy shit to Heavy. So other people, they ain't give a fuck about it. Right, right. So he never came at Heavy D crazy. But I want to go back to this lawsuit, right, by Cassie. She claims that, you know, she hid out at a friend house in Florida after, you know, Diddy put hands on her. And she said that she was tracked down by a guy named James Cruz, the president of Bad Boy Management. You know anything about that? James Cruz and Harpier always been Diddy's flunkies, especially Harpier. That's why he's being sued right now, too, by one of his assistants and stuff like that, because I guess he learned from his boss. But James Cruz used to work for 50. But he worked for Diddy first. I thought it was 50. So the niggas was always scum buckets, man. Right, right. But speaking of Harvey Pierre, how do you feel about him getting accused of sexual assault? Uh, like I said, anything that has to do with those sexual assaults, those people have to prove that. But is it are they capable? Yeah, they're capable. Look at the atmosphere. They're in the music industry. They're in the music business. They set up those type of, uh, uh, they, they learn the tricks of the trade. For instance, guys don't put those pills that they get to the girls in the champagne bottles because they popping them in front of them. Most of those girls, especially if they like mixed drinks, you understand, they see the bottles when they open them and they're trying to keep their eyes on because they don't want to get no kind of drugs put in their system. But what they don't understand is in the orange juice and it's in the cranberry juice. They didn't put the pills and the stuff in there, the roofies, the ecstasy, the ease, all, whatever they, they put it in the juice. Now, those girls who like the mixed drinks, you understand what I'm saying? They gonna pour their own sexual act because they don't understand it ain't in the bottles, it's in the juice. Those guys, they Dang. learn that. Dang. And they put it to those girls who don't know no better. Wow. Wow. This is gonna bring wow. This is gonna bring numbers. Wow. That was crazy. That was crazy. Joe, rap is the only future of rap. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Let's not forget that Diddler was involved in Tupac's assassination. Some people say that. Some people that I've heard that I heard that earlier today. I I had heard that earlier today. There are all people, all sorts of people, speculating that he's that he's mobbed up, or not mobbed up, but that he's that he's that he works with different things. In fact, I'm gonna. I'm going to jump to this video here that this guy did, breaking down this complaint 
where he gives a little bit of an overview here. We just got the Jeffrey Epstein of the music and entertainment industry. The new lawsuit that just dropped against Diddy is massive and it has photos, it has videos, it names names. And there's so much here that it's never gonna fit into a single video. So I'm gonna do a quick overview in this video and then I'm gonna do a couple of parts breaking down all the different aspects of what's come out so far. We're talking crime scenes. We're talking photo evidence of celebrities like Cuba Gooding Jr. We're talking record label executives. We're talking hidden cameras in every room of the house getting recordings of celebrities, executives, politicians at parties with celebrities and underage girls with drinks being spiked with drugs. This goes all the way back to the murder of Tupac and Biggie. We're talking about the entire rap and hip hop industry and the whole music industry at large. But to be clear, this is just opinions and speculation. These are not statements of fact. When I show sources in the background, like- Well, they're, they're allegations. So there are claims that they're factual, but we, they're not established as being factual. The court case, you should take those for just what they are. I'm not saying that all of this is necessarily real. So what's happened just now is that this man, Rodney Jones, who is a music producer that worked with Sean Combs, who is Diddy, he just filed this lawsuit. And he didn't just file it against Diddy. He filed against the executives at all of the companies associated. An interesting question. And against the companies like Universal Music Group. His lawyers claim that he has secured hundreds of hours of footage and audio recordings of Diddy and his staff and his guests engaging in serious illegal activity. It's illegal for lawyers to make yes. these claims if they don't have reasonable belief that this evidence is legitimate and uh, exists. That's they could get true. So, so he's, I don't know. I don't know if he's the Black Epstein. I don't know. Disbarred for making these claims if they're not true. And some of that evidence is but that fits in, in with, with like with, when Diddy with what, allegedly shot a man. With what Jacob and then was saying, the LAPD saw that room in the photo, the bathroom with all that blood, and were on the scene for hours, and no arrests were made. They went with the explanation that Diddy told his staff to give, which was it was a drive-by shooting. Diddy made it clear that his head of security, Fahim Muhammad, had the power to make people and problems disappear. This guy. And all of Diddy's staff were instructed to contact Mr. Muhammad if they were ever pulled over by the police in Miami or California. Diddy often bragged about having law enforcement under control. Although the deeper you look, the more it looks like people above him and above law enforcement had him under control. We'll go more into these cases in the detailed videos, but now the bigger picture. See so there you go. Anyway, so that's his breakdown of it. There's a lot to unpack here. Now, we're sitting here trying to figure out why Homeland Security is involved in doing this raid. Why would it not be the FBI? If this is just drugs and girls and, you know, your standard SA, you would think that would be the FBI. So the question is, people are speculating that this implies that there was trafficking going on that perhaps involved some illegals being trafficked through his various estates and that he was potentially involved with that because you sort of ask yourself, why, why is, I'm just very confused why DHS would be involved. I'm very, I'm very, to me, that's the really weird wrinkle here. If you told me that, you know, the FBI is involved, they'd be like, okay, fine. They saw this civil complaint. They're like, we got to act. Maybe, maybe if he is related to FBI or CIA or some other triple letter agency, you know, around the world. I don't know. I mean, I can understand the FBI if you want to tell me that they're even doing engaging in some cover up. Look, when people were talking to me about the whole Epstein situation and suggestions that he was involved with triple letter agencies or perhaps even a creation, their creation to perhaps get blackmail material on people. I was like, you know what? That sounds like something the FBI would do. I can't rule that out. That sounds like something the FBI would do because everyone's sitting there trying to figure out how Epstein made his money. So I'm like, do I know that's what happened? No. Would I go in public and say, yeah, this is, you know, that's what happened? I I wouldn't only because I, I you know, I don't, I don't know that. And I feel like it'd be reckless for me to make the claim. All I can say is that those people who are making those claims 
I get it. And I'd have a difficult time refuting it. That doesn't mean those claims are true. It just means I can't figure out that they're not true. They don't sound crazy. They don't sound like, wow, that's really that's really reaching there. In a lot of ways, they seem to make some, make a lot more sense than, than, than the people who are rejecting those claims. So in that sense, at the same time, I'm not at a place where I would say, yes, it is true, because I think that that would be reckless for me to take that position because I don't know that it's true. So that's where I'm at with Epstein. Now, it doesn't seem like there's the same type of blackmail thing going on here. At least there's no indication that we know of as of yet. This, The claims here, as spelled out in this civil complaints, they imply a lot of illegal activities happening here. A lot of illegal activity and a guy who's been enabled by a whole bunch of folks based on his money and his connections and and his star power to basically live life like in, in complete in, with complete un, unfettered hedonism and unchecked by anyone because people are terrified of him does that 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 sounds that's and it's consistent with the fact that you know at least with him we can sort of figure out where he made his money right the, the dude made you know he was successful he was a highly decorated musician very successful. You expect that successful people are going to amass great fortunes. So that none of that is like nearly as his wealth is not nearly the same question mark that that Jeffrey Epstein's wealth was. Also, it doesn't seem like there's the same end game of having all this blackmail material on people. If anything, he seems to be exposing himself to creating legal exposure for himself rather than exposure for others. So that would seem to be less aligned with what with what you would think would be the interests of the FBI. I mean, the FBI, the CIA, the AAA agencies, if they have the ability to control someone by knowing that they can be leveraged through some asset of theirs into playing particular roles, you know, to suit the needs of the FBI or any of these AAA agencies, you can understand that they'd be happy to be able to control a blackmailer of these of these people. Right? That That you can understand how that would be something that would be of interest to them. I don't understand how they have the same benefit from a guy who doesn't seem to be blackmailing others, but if anything is making himself exposed to black being blackmailed. So that's why I, I don't I don't really I don't understand that connection yet. That doesn't mean that someone won't be able to walk me through it. If any of you have theories as to why it is that he's some asset of the FBI, the CIA, you know, which is based on anything other than he reminds me of Epstein. Um, I'm all ears. I'm all I'm all ears. Love to hear your thoughts on that. So he made flights to Epstein Land. Okay. I don't think most of the people who made flights to Epstein Land were part were were I think they were the suckers. Twisted, evil, disturbing people. Definitely. I'm not trying to give a pass to any of these people. What I'm saying is, but they were basically the ones who were putting themselves in a position to become assets and controlled by the FBI. So, but that's not the same thing as working for the FBI. That's, see what I'm saying? DHS primarily investigations of Kitty. Is it? Is it? Perhaps. Perhaps when it's, you know, international. That could be. That could be. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, I had a couple other things I wanted to cover for you. This I'm gonna, this is I I don't know what to do when people make requests to me. I get very very torn when people make requests to me because I I I I like to trust people. And assume that everything is on the up and up. And I have absolutely no reason to think that this is not 100% on the up and up. But at the same time, I feel like if I throw something out there, that sort of becomes my endorsement. Where it's like I'm saying, oh, I'm speaking on their behalf. And that's why I want to make clear before I introduce this. I'm not speaking on this person's behalf. I'm simply sharing with you that this is a, is a follower of mine. 
uh, who reached out to me asking for me to publish and publicize a uh, give send go that she created so that she can afford the cost of a memorial. And this is Gary Gary Harris's memorial expense, which is looking to raise eighty five hundred dollars. And saying a year ago today, I received a call driver so long. My ex husband and father of my two sons passed away. His handsome, kind man, big heart, who tragically lost his battle to addiction with the aid of fentanyl. We had to part ways a decade ago when it came clear that mental illness and addiction was stronger than his ability to stay on the path of living our lives together and raising our beautiful boys in a healthy and safe environment. He had to make the diff she had to make the difficult decision in her life and ask him to leave our home until he was able to get sober on his own and for himself. And this time, since supporting and trying to help him in his fight would always end up being a temporary fix. And she goes on about the struggles of loving an addict. And she said, it always seemed like there would be more time that our children would see and reconnect with their dad again. So when that call came, my grief and regret of not trying hard to find a way to keep him in our lives set in. And she said how difficult it was for a boy to talk to him on the phone because he would lose, because he wasn't really rational when he was on the phone and it left them confused. It's a real trap. It's a real... The story that's portrayed here is very sad. It's very sad. And apparently this man has passed. And she wants to make funeral arrangements before his siblings leave town, which supposedly is in a couple of weeks. And she asked me to share her link. So I'm going to stress again. I read this story and I was like, this is, this is a sad story. I have no reason to question its legitimacy. As far as I know, it's completely true. But I've done nothing more to vet the truth of this than what I've just read to you. So, and unfortunately, I feel it's it's very unfortunate that I have to warn you that there are some people out there who are illegitimate. And I cannot, I, I don't have enough hubris to claim that someone could not, you know, someone be incapable of, of successfully deceiving me. I personally have no stake in this give, send, go. None of this money would benefits me, and I have no idea. I'm only sharing it with you because I was asked to share it with you. And you can make your own determinations. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the link. I'll put the link in the chat. And um, I'll also put it in the description. So those of you who are interested in helping support, it's, you know, I, I commend, I commend acts of charity. So the only reason I feel uncomfortable when people ask me that is specifically because you see how I just struggle with like, I don't know. It sounds really sad. It sounds terrible. I, I, I wish I could help people, but I don't want to, I can't. And then I'll, you know, God forbid if I, convince people to give money and then I find out like you know three months from now that someone who I spoke up for you know wasn't being completely truthful that would make me feel crappy also so like I still sort of feel like I understand why people ask me and then, yeah so that's why I do it the way I do it and and each of you can decide what you want to do with that so I'll even pin it here where I can pin it and let me check out my poll. <laughs> all you were over 30. You're all old. You're all old like me. Yes, I'm over 30. 45%. No, I'm over 30. No, most of you don't know what blotto means. All right. Blotto meant, means drunk out of your mind. That's what blotto means. None of my, my kids, my nieces or nephews knew what Blotto was. Which when it's like in the chorus in describing the scene of a song, it's very frustrating to learn after the fact. I never even thought of it. I just need a good rhyme. Um, okay, so I wanted to get that out of the way. I also wanted to cover a couple of other things. First of all, those of you who have concerns about the election or are very reliant on the election, I don't know how this ended up in my 
in my timeline, but I saw this and I was like, I have to share this with my audience. This is something I need to share with my audience. This is something they want to know about, they want to see. I don't know how this ended up in my timeline here, but when they counted the ballots, they came up with 1,300 or 1,400 ballots eight hours after poll closed. When they got caught, they came out and said, well, it's 16,000 ballots. You have to watch some of these videos. This woman is uh, delivering a stack of ballots. This woman is uh, delivering a stack of ballots. And the person behind her rolls down the window and hands her a ballot to put in the ballot box with her stack. And then she goes back to her car with the stack of ballots again. And I think at that point she realized that the ballots were not signed. And so you're going to watch her sign each ballot in the, <laughs> in the vehicle. And she signs them and then puts them on the dashboard individually. First she searches for a pen, so it takes a second. But we've got this speeded up so you can see. But yeah, so she's signing. And, and when it's slowed down, you can see the pen in her hand when she reaches up and puts the ballot on the dashboard each time. That is awesome. Yeah, so she's that's man. it. You guys are you good. Guys fun. Are fantastic. Good fun. That's yeah, fantastic. They, they did a great, great job. Fun. Unbelievable. They did a great job finding this. And as you yeah. can see, there it is right there. And they did a close up with the camera. The footage is very clear. There she goes, right to the drop box. So, uh, mission accomplished. Unbelievable. That's the first one. Here's the next one. Great we job. Have, we have one, one more clip. Patty, do you want to set that one up? That's the stack. Uh, the, the man in the black Nike oh. shoes who was <laughs> very busy that day this is election day I, I believe it might be the day before but uh patty you you have yeah so he was um first confronted by one of the um the team members that was watching the detroit office of elections and several ballot drop boxes they had teams of people that were watching the drop boxes um and uh so he was confronted he was carrying a stack of, of blank ballots out of the Department of Elections and he was standing by the curb and one of the people um, that was working in this team asked him where he was going with them. And he got nervous and said that he was delivering them to one of the satellite locations that was about seven miles away. And when they asked what, how, why he was delivering blank ballots that were not in a container, he um, said he had been doing it all day. That was his fifth trip. And then um, he got nervous and started to walk away and they asked him where he was going. He said he was gonna walk there, which was seven miles away. And then the video that Jim just showed is about seven or nine minutes after they saw this man that said he was walking seven miles to the next um, satellite district or uh, satellite office to drop off blank ballots. So we just walk around right blank there, ballots, so. why not? It's, it's, it's interesting, there's, there's obviously more. They saw this guy around and he was a very busy person in Detroit. You just walk uh, around blank the, ballots. That's nothing to nothing to be alarmed. Nothing to be alarmed. Amazing. The, yeah, the next clip we have is um, a postal worker who uh, uh, made four stops within an hour. We have the timestamps right there. And again, this is speeded up a little bit, I think. Um, but sh she made four different stops within an hour at the Dropbox. We're not same sure Dropbox. The, yeah, we're not sure about the legality of this. Um, but it certainly appeared suspect. Um, so here she is going back again and again. Uh, we haven't seen a, other post office workers doing this, so that's why this this stood out to us. Did you want to add anything on that, Patty? Yeah, just the, in the final video. So this is the same person, and the number on the vehicle matches um, each time. So in the fourth visit, she comes back, and this is her, a private vehicle. So this is not a post office vehicle. Um, she comes back for a fourth trip with a big stack. That's a pretty substantial stack of ballots. Um, Unbelievable. she throws them in the drop box and then great work, guys. This private is, vehicle. This is that's great. And we got one more video here. And uh, she was working inside the TCF that morning. So we put in a request to get this video. It took months. And uh, we got this at Gateway Pundit. We put this up on a Twitter, you know, on our site. We tweeted about it, and that's when we uh, lost our Twitter account, by the way, um, by putting up this video. Um, there's a lead car, uh, an escort car that comes in. You can see here. Um, each time he hands something to the people inside, and then the, this uh, this van drives in, uh, and they actually came in twice. Now we had local media, one of the top reporters there. I'm not going to mention his name. Uh, he said that this never happened. Uh, he was there all night. There was no fraud. Nothing happened. So now we have the video of that.
What's interesting about this, though, and that's why we included it today, is for one, it'd be wonderful to have some ping data on who these people are driving the escort car because we found out later this escort car was from I was just uh, thinking that. A, a Pennsylvania license. So it's a rental car, we believe. Um, and uh, uh, But what we found from Patty's group, the Michigan group, is um, they counted the, the drop box ballot. Yeah, I remember seeing this video days, also, Churchill Hall. Um, there was only about uh, 1,400 um, in, in the area that were dropped off the past, the, the last two days, the ones that they counted. They've um, actually watched every drop box and counted the ballots for every single person that dropped a ballot in um, in Detroit. So they counted the ballots. And that's about pallets. the they came up with around 1,340. Up, yeah, 1,300, 1,400. And then... Um, when these were dropped off and they got caught, they came out and said, well, it was just 16,000 ballots. So we're not sure where they got these. This was eight hours after the, after the you know, uh, everything was shut down. You're supposed to have your ballots in at 8 p.m. You know, eight hours later, they bring this inside the TCF, a big, huge drop. And um, we know now they came in twice with, with uh, 60 uh, boxes of ballots the first time, another 13 or 12 or 13 the second time. And they're telling us, um, you know, that they had 16,000. We're wondering, because of, of, of the work this group in Michigan has done, well, where'd those ballots come from? We we have no idea. Well, so. And when you look at it in context with the guy earlier who's carrying ballots around, this whole thing is just, it's crazy. It's crazy. With, I mean, it's insanity. Anyway, I thought I'd share that with you because, you know, why not? <laughs> I saw it and I was like, I was like, all right, this makes me think it'll probably make my, my audience think also. Now, the other thing I wanted to cover is in case you, you missed it, Rona McDaniel was brought, was brought on to MSNBC. And apparently this has them freaking out, freaking out, freaking out. How dare they bring in such a political hack? Never mind that we brought in Jem Psaki while she was. While she was the press secretary. Now, check out this conversation with this lunatic, Chuck Todd. Politi Chief political correspondent for MSNBC. Lunatic Ch Chuck Todd. Airheaded Chuck Todd. Let me deal with the elephant in the room. Yeah. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation. He had to interview Ronan McDaniel, and they and they think this is and oh my God, the battle scars that Kirsten had from having to interview Ronan McDaniel. Ronan McDaniel, who during the course of this interview sold out the J Sixers, sold them out, and said anyone who went in there, yeah, go ahead and punish them, go ahead and punish them. Ronan McDaniel, career hack, Ronan McDaniel, that she's too far right, too far right, too far right. Ugh. Ugh. Because I don't know what to believe. She is now a paid contributor by NBC News. Well, I have no idea whether any answer she gave to you was because she didn't want to mess up her contract. Mm -hmm. um, she wants us to believe that she was speaking for the RNC when the RNC was paying for her. So she has, she has credibility issues that she still has to deal with. Yeah. She is she speaking for herself or is she speaking on behalf before of she ever walked her? into MSNBC? But once at the RNC, she did say that, hey, I'm speaking for the party. I get that. That's part of the job. So what about here? I, I will say this. I think your interview uh, did a good job of exposing, I think, many of the contradictions. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting. Mm. have been met with character assassination. So it is, it, you know, that's where you begin here. And so um, when NBC made the decision to give her NBC News's credibility, you got to ask yourself, what does she bring? And Their credibility? Your credibility? Give them your credibility? NBC News. And when we make deals like this, and I've been at this company a long time, mm. you're doing it for access. Access to audience, 
Sometimes it's access to an individual, mm -hmm. um, and we can have a de journalistic ethics debate about that. And I, 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 I'm willing to have that debate. Whenever anyone says we can have a debate about that, and I'm willing to have that debate, they know we will never have that debate. That is the biggest cop-out statement in the world. Oh, we can have a discussion about that, but that's not for now. That's for another time. That will never, ever, ever happen. But we can have that debate. We can. No, we can. No, really, we can. We can. Why don't you do it now? Let's do it right now. It's a good time. As good as time as any. And if you told me we were hiring her as a technical advisor to the Republican convention, I think that would be certainly... Um, defensible. If you told me but that would be defensible, we're we're talking to her, but let's let's see how she does in some interviews. There was no maybe conversation with like this, actual no, journalists Taki inside the hard. network. See, see if it's a two way. Mm -hmm. What she can bring the network. So I do think, unfortunately, this interview is always going to be looked through the prism of right. who is she speaking for, right. Right? right? I think you did everything you could do. You got put into an impossible situation yeah. booking this interview, and then all of a sudden the rugs pull out from under you. You find out she's being paid to show up. That's it's unfortunate for this program, but I am glad you did the best that you could, and that's why the three of us are on here to to try to um, bolster that editorial independence. Why? Well, I, I, I love how he was like, "Oh, he put you in an impossible position. Oh, such a tough. Oh, so the burden is so hard. Oh, how did you how did you manage to overcome it? And you did such a phenomenal job with it, Kirsten. Oh, Kirsten, that was amazing, amazing. Oh, uh, gosh." We'll get more from MSNBC in a moment. The deep state needs plausible deniability. This is about uh, Sean, uh, Sean Combs, I believe. Running drugs in the 80s and 90s, assassination of problem people. They co-opted the gangs to carry out, protect their assets. Diddler was Suge Knight's right-hand man. Okay. All right. That's a theory. That's something. I asked for a theory. Not bad. Not bad. Saying he was their front man to basically act like a lunatic, and it's just oh, it's just some lunatic rapper. It's not the, not that the deep state wants to get rid of this person. That's an interesting theory. Susan so was deeply connected to CIA. I think Burns has a video on it. All right. Did you hear about the found ballots in, about found ballots in the election for the new DA of Cook County, Illinois? No, I did not. I did not hear about that. Inside the MSNPC hysterical bubble. Well, we got one more for you. One more for you. Is this it? No, that's not it. Uh. Where were you? Where were you? Go back. We'll stop. Robbie. their video of it. Why is this not working? There we go. Morning host Joe Scarborough and Mika Brzezinski. I ring a former RNC chair, Ronna McDaniel. Well, uh, she was on Sunday's Meet the Press. It was her first appearance since the NBC and since NBC News hired her as a political analyst. Uh, I know you won't be surprised to know that we've been inundated with calls this weekend, as have uh, uh, most people connected with this network about it. By your nine viewers. BC's decision to hire her. Uh, we learned about the hiring when we read about it in the press on Friday. Uh, Linda, did you call? Did you call in, Linda? Did you, did you call them having a freak out, Linda? Uh, we weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it for several re reasons. Uh, including, but not limited to, as lawyers might say, 
Miss McDaniel's role in Donald Trump's fake electric scheme. All of this. Ha- <laughs> Anyhow, I'm not going to watch this because if I do that, if I do that, these people, these people like to strike you. So no, I'm not even going to mention their name because they're bastards. They're cowards. They're cucks and losers. So I might have to cut out that entire segment if they if they realize I use their work. Where they were using where they were using MSNBC's work. But anyway, so I wanted to share that with you. Why is this slow now? It's not what I wanted. And I got that. I got that. I got that. There was one more thing I wanted to cover for you. Here you are. One last thing I wanted to cover for you. Skier, who see- how old is this? Let me see how old this is. I don't know. This got shared yesterday. So it's new. It's new for me and probably for you. Your favorite, Senator Kennedy, questioning a climate change activist skier. Here you go. Here you go. Go get him. Go get him, Senator Kennedy. What is what is carbon dioxide? <laughs> I'm. I went to high school, but that's Gus Schumacher. Gus Schumacher. Resident, resident, pretty boy, cross country skier Gus Schumacher. It's gonna, it's gonna fill us in on the science of carbon dioxide. Uh, carbon dioxide is a, a gas. Mm, all right, so far so good. Okay. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm not a professional to talk about carbon dioxide so much. You, you, you came here to, to talk about climate, climate change, and too much carbon dioxide. Not here to talk about carbon dioxide. Oh, okay. Much, but well, you, you want us to abolish it, right? No, I, <laughs> there's always going to be carbon dioxide. Oh. Right. So, so what is it you want us to do? I now, let, me, let me back up because I, I want to. I mean, you're here as an expert. Tell me more about what carbon dioxide is. I'm here as an expert cross country skier who sees the changes in my winters and. The landscape that I live in in Alaska. Why do you think it's because of carbon dioxide? So this is what he can't answer. Why do you think it's carbon dioxide? Maybe, maybe there's this giant troll who's doing like heavy breathing and melting the snow away before you get there. You never thought of that, did you? It's possible. You don't know. You don't know, do you? And so carbon dioxide is what I see it as is, you know, it's a gas that exists in our atmosphere. And what, is it the major part of our atmosphere? Or? It's a huge part of our atmosphere, yeah. It's actually a very small part. Maybe it's nitrogen. Maybe it's too much nitrogen. You don't know. How do you know? If people told you it was nitrogen, you'd be saying it's nitrogen that's a problem. If people told you that it was cardiac arrhythmia, you'd, you'd, you'd believe that was the problem. They just say science and you'd say, oh, okay. I'm going to just repeat what they're saying, and now I'm the expert. From our atmosphere. Well, okay. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. What are you asking specifically? Uh, well, you said we need to reduce carbon dioxide emissions. I'd like to know first if you know what it is. You want us to abolish fossil fuels? I never said that. You never have said that? No. Okay. What, what do you think we ought to do with fossil fuels? What will we do with fossil fuels? Yeah. Should we make any changes? I would like to see a decrease in the use of fossil fuels. I think there's a possibility to use more electric generation. Okay. How dare you? How dare you? How d- over uh, Over what period of time? 10 years, 50 years, 100 years? That's not. I would like to see it come as fast as possible while continuing. How fast? On. Sorry? How fast? Super duper fast. I'm not, I don't have a good you don't answer know? for that, no. Okay, you just think, well, uh, how, how much will it cost for us to uh, become carbon neutral in the United States by 2050? 
I'm not a professional on that. I don't have an idea. You don't have any idea? No. You, you just think we ought to spend the money? I'm not an economist. Yeah, but it's going to cost money. You realize that. Yeah, but we've also talked about the the trade-off of what the cost of climate change as emergencies will cost in the future also. so Right, but it's going to cost trillions of dollars to become carbon neutral by 20,050, right? I do not know. You don't know. You just think we ought to do it. I I don't have a great answer for you, but I think okay. I would. It, like if we spent if we spent those trillions of dollars and became carbon neutral by 2050 in the United States, um, would you advocate how much will it reduce world temperatures? I don't have an answer for that. You don't know. No. You just think we ought to spend the money and then see what happens. Cross your fingers. I think as an athlete, I think if we spend that money and invest in our future, hopefully those temperatures stop rising. Well, and maybe we'll, we'll, that's basically saying we'll cross our fingers. We'll spend we'll spend ninety five trillion dollars and, and cross our fingers. Maybe the snow at least stabilizes where it is for me. But yeah, I don't think anyone knows for sure. I don't know anyway. Well, when 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 when. My colleagues invite witnesses to come to us to tell us, uh, advise us on passing legislation. I always check out the background of our witnesses because I like to know who I'm talking to. Um, I'm, I checked yours out, Mr. Schumacher, um, and I want to be sure I understand it as I evaluate your testimony. Uh, on June 8, 2020, you tweeted, I'm going to quote, the war on drugs was intentionally created to incarcerate black people en masse, end quote. The Who war on the drugs, phrase? you said, was in There's no way he knows the phrase en masse. No friggin' way. Who wrote that for you? That's what he should be asking. Who wrote that tweet for you? Intentionally created to incarcerate black people en masse. Who intentionally created the war on drugs to put black people in jail? Who were you talking about? I don't remember typing that. You don't? No. It's on your Twitter feed. Maybe a retweet. I don't know. I haven't used that in a while. Well, also, even it if it's a retweet, like it's... it shows your support, right? Maybe, yeah. I. But it's not the topic of this conversation. I right, think. right. But it has to do with you're here giving us advice and i just kind of like to know a little bit more about you yeah i'm you. i mean i'm here as an athlete giving you <laughs> my story and what i've seen <laughs> in my on, on august 27th of 2020 you tweeted this quote i'm gonna quote police are paid with taxpayer dollars if they are not answerable to us we can demand new service and that's what this is abolish the police in favor of that new service, end quote. You think we ought to abolish the police, do you? Again, not the topic I'm here to talk about today. I know, but but you tweeted it. Do you think we ought to abolish the police? That's not what I'm here to talk about. Should we do that before or after we get rid of fossil fuels? N I'm not going to address that. That's... Yeah, you don't want to address it. Okay. Uh, let me ask you about one more of your tweets. On August 26, 2020, you tweeted, there's a picture, I'm not going to describe the picture, but you said, quote, your words, not mine, it's on your Twitter feed, the, quote, this is what systemic racism looks like. The Los Angeles Police Department is literally policing only the Black Lives Matter side, end quote. What do you mean by that? Uh, this is still off topic. Okay. No, it's not. You're here as an expert telling us, <laughs> advising us, and I'm asking you about your 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 background. I'm here as an athlete to talk about the effects of climate change on my sport. Okay, let's go back. Anyhow, so he's out of time here. Well, I'm almost out of time. Well, you're well out of time, and we have Wait, other senators like, waiting. So. Shut up. Shut up. Leave him alone. Leave Leave the kid alone. Don't touch his hair. Don't touch his hair. Leave the kid alone. Leave him alone. He's just a boy. He's just a boy. This isn't fair. And finally tonight, this was shared with me during the show, and I just want to let you know that I will be covering this. Someone someone asked me 
and on uh, locals where you should be signed up at goodlogic.locals.com because I make appearances. I'm not always on YouTube. Sometimes I'm on playback. Sometimes I stream directly to locals. Sometimes I'm streaming. Sometimes I'm on spaces. If only to get f- find out where I'm going to be, you got to sign you got to sign up to goodlogic.locals.com. That's good logic like my name dot locals with the ness for savings dot com good logic dot locals dot com finally i just want to let you know that I, one of the people one of my diggers in local in locals asked me about this judge sets new hearing date in 2020 george election interference case on monday afternoon order fulton county superior court judge scott mcafee said new hearing date Attorneys representing former President Trump and former Georgia Republican Chairman David Schaefer are due back to court on Thursday for a hearing to address three motions according to the judge's order. I expect to be covering this on Thursday. He's very good about sharing and live streaming this stuff. So on Thursday morning, I anticipate that I will be live streaming Scott McAfee on these three motions, which honestly, I haven't even looked at them yet to know what they're what they're covering. But I do definitely plan on live streaming that. And by then, I will certainly be far more knowledgeable to stay abreast of where you can find me, goodlogic.locals.com. No matter where you are, one thing that I should always keep in mind is the little cartoon guy is going to tell you, please make sure you like and subscribe. And he knows best because he's a cartoon. And cartoons, they never lie. Cartoons never lie. They're full of truth. So there you go. Little thumbs up. That's me with a beard. I miss my beard. It'll come back. All right. So that's goodlogic.locals.com. That's my show for tonight. I thank you all for joining me. I will see you, God willing, tomorrow. And I'm probably going to be doing a thing, a stream on playback tomorrow, which is another reason you'll be following me. Almost definitely going to be doing something on playback tomorrow. So you'll get notifications about all of that tomorrow. And my show tomorrow and all the other good stuff that I try covering and providing to you in ways that are both informative, enlightening, and hopefully somewhat entertaining. I'm Joe, also known as Good Logic, available at goodlogic.locals.com. I thank you for joining me. Make sure that no matter what you're doing, stay happy, don't eat the bugs, and good night, Godspeed. Oh, I got this. I remember her. Yeah. <laughs> night.